are you? I'm very excited. Very happy. That's good, because you're not usually very excited. Not, not much you know, gets you, you say excited. that almost every week. You say well, that all the time. Because you're an egomaniac. But it's not true. You're an egomaniac, you know, and you don't get excited. It's not true. Yeah. Maybe uh, when you look in the mirror, you get excited. That's about it. I, I told you I'm not vain. I, maybe I do have a big ego, but I'm not vain. Okay, okay Steve. well, you know, you're, why you're do confusing you have a big the ego? Two things. Why do you have a big ego? I don't. You're the one who put, put that moniker on me. I don't. It's not true. That label, you labeled me this, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know where it's okay. coming from. All right, never mind. Let's, let's bring on our guest. we have a very special guest. guest. Listen, I have all the credits. I have things about his life but really this guest needs no introduction if you don't know who he is when i say his name you should not be listening to this podcast and let me so tell you if this you don't too. know who this guy is just turn it off and do something else because he's such an important part of why we're here you know and such an important part of our culture and our times uh, in in so many ways uh you know you know what's I really amazing? don't have to go through everything he's done because it's a lot and we know it. What's amazing, he is, uh, uh, he was on the, uh, possibly the greatest show in TV history, one of the stars, and in possibly the greatest rock and roll band in history. That's amazing. That is true. And he kind of had the same role in both of those things, you know? He was like, the right hand man to the boss, the the kind of the advisor, the consigliere, you know, the counsel, the you know, the behind the scenes, pulling the strings. I'm just gonna say, let's bring on Stephen Van Zandt. There yes, he is. sir. Stevie Hi, boy, guys. Stevie boy, how are you? Good. Good to see you. It's good You're to see you. You're looking terrific. I haven't seen you in a you. long time. You're good. I know. Yeah, yeah, you know, we're all Doing what we can do, right? We're, we're, we're yeah. hanging in there. Uh, Stevie, yeah. let me ask you. We'll we get started. So you grew up in Mass. You go to Jersey. When did you know you wanted to be a musician? Or were you secretly wanted to be an actor before a musician? I don't know. No, no. Never uh, never thought about acting. Um, the first thing I did was my grandfather, who was from Calabria, uh, showed me a, a song from his village. Um, this is, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm like 11, 12 years old. And then uh, very soon after that, um, the Beatles came and, and played the Ed Sullivan Show. Um, you probably have an older audience who may know what Ed Sullivan was, but let me just quickly say that it was a variety show that the entire family would watch every Sunday night. Uh, Ed Sullivan owned Sunday nights uh, until the Sopranos that took it over. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, whatever it was, 72 million of us watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, uh, which was the first time anyone had ever seen a, a, a rock and roll band. Uh, believe it or not, um, before that, there was a lot of individuals. It was, you know, Bo Diddley and Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley, and there were doo-wop groups and instrumental groups. But uh, there wasn't really a band that sang and played like them they were very unique and that uh that my entire generation probably would tell you the same thing and that that's the day you know you wanted to you wanted to do it although by the time we discovered the beatles they were already halfway through the career you know they had gotten together in 57 they were gone by the end of 69 so february 9th 1964 they were kind of half you know already very very good you know they had been they had been in and around the clubs for five six years and so they were so sophisticated that they it, it revealed a whole new world to us and uh, they made it look easier than it was. So basically what I like to say is the Beatles revealed a whole new world to us and the Rolling Stones invited us in, you know. And that was it for me. That's I, I, you know, it was, it was a godsend for me because I had no interest in what society was offering, you know, the complete freak, misfit, outcast, and uh, all of a sudden, we had a. There was hope, you know. This new rock and roll. You world. saw the Beatles play, right? Live, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. The second time at Shea Stadium, um, you know, which was just uh, lucky, and uh, they were amazing. They sounded, they sounded fantastic, playing in a stadium with no monitors, 
no yeah, monitors they were, they and kids doing. screaming their head off, right? And like the, yeah, the yeah, audience yeah. was making incredible amounts of noise. That's and, what I mean. But they were so. You know, and Stevie, you got to be friends with all of them, correct? Did you know uh, John Lennon well? I know you know McCartney no. well and Ringo. Yeah, no, no, I never met John or George. Uh, oh, no? unfortunately, no, no. So from there yeah. on out, you decide you see the Beatles. You're going to be a musician, and then what? You just sing Garage Bands. You, you know. Yep. Uh, yep. I played a uh, played a bunch of different bands, and. Um, so it was about a dozen of us who actually had bands playing the high school dances. I mean, there was a million places to play in those days. We were the luckiest generation. It was amazing. Amazing. Um, but, but, you know, slowly, as, as the options came up, kids took it. You know, they go to college. They, they go on their father's job. They go on the service. Uh, you know, and in the end, there was only two freaks left standing, me and Bruce Springsteen, you know. <laughs> um, you know, and people always say, oh, you were so, you know. You were so steadfast and so, you know, courageous to, you know, to, to hang in there and, you know, do what you believe, you know. I'm like, that, that's really not true, okay? We, we were not capable of doing anything else. We were, we were completely incompetent at, 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 at the world, you know? <laughs> anyway, so um, eventually he gets, he gets signed to a record deal. And uh, I go up there, and um, they didn't, uh, the manager didn't want a second guitar player. This is like 72. And I was feeling like we missed the boat already by then. So um, when um, I ended up not, not joining that, particular, that first band of Bruce's that was signed, I just quit the business for two years. I, I went and worked construction wow. on uh, Route 287 and the Turnpike. And I just figured, you know, we, we missed the boat. You know, all the action has happened. You know, the great, the renaissance is over. You know, I wasn't really that wrong, you know, but, but you know, there was more to come. But the renaissance was over, you know. Yeah, Stevie, I, where, where, did you, where did you meet Springsteen? Was he in the neighborhood? You grew up in the same well, he, town? Well, he, he was one of the dozen bands. Yeah, he one, one of the dozen bands that got out, out of the garage. And, um, and it was a circuit. Uh, there, there was a, we had a bunch of great, rock and roll tv shows on at the time like like there was 10 10 rock and roll right what was it the that's right shindy Hullabaloo was one of them shindy that's right. uh, Hullabaloo. Sh upbeat shivery um every dj had their own show jerry blavid uh, uh uh you know i forget a half of that murray decay uh and then there was there was variety shows you know at sullivan hollywood palace uh the smothers brothers it was like 10, 10 rock and roll shows on every week, and one of them, one of them was Hullabaloo, and they had a franchise. Uh, they, they franchised the name to clubs, and there was a club in my town, Middletown. Uh, there was a club in Asbury Park, which is like south, and which is Bruce's town. And that made like a triangle, and then the fourth side, if you will, would be the, would be the Jersey, you know, the, 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 the beach clubs. So there was like a circuit. I started running into him, you know, on weekends, I would sneak up to the village where I live now and half a block from where I am, um, I would go to the Cafe Wa and see the bands. They had bands all day long and they were like a year ahead of New Jersey, you know, so I would steal whatever I would steal and bring it back for band, and, you know, and when and I, and I started running into Bruce doing the same thing. So at that point, we really became friendly. We're like, wow, we're both. We're both nutty enough to, you know, go an hour on the bus to s steal licks from 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 bands, and you know, the, and we we you know, then we started coming up to the village together, you know, after that, and uh, became friendly. And uh, anyway, I, you know, I worked construction for two years, and then uh, uh, playing football on the weekends. I, I broke my finger, still bent, and uh, and uh, to to exercise my finger, I joined a band playing piano on the weekends turns out that the the, the brother uh, cousin of the drummer was one of the dovells uh the dovells were an early 60s group that had you can't sit down and bristol stomp you know two of the greatest records really um so we became uh just it became the backup group for the dovells and jumped on the what they call the oldie circuit in those days didn't you what play with frankie valley you opened for him 
Well, and with well, the yeah, Dovell? Yeah, we, yeah, I was excited about doing the oldie circuit because not only were, were you playing, you know, we played Madison Square Garden for the first time, um, and then also on, the, on that circuit, you, you would play Vegas. And I was very excited about going to Vegas because I was a real gambler as a kid. And, uh, you know, I didn't go anywhere without my John Scarney gambling book. You know, the, the guy who actually figured out the odds in Vegas, he had, he had, his, he had his own gambling book. Did it work? And, uh, uh, no. Uh, I mean, you know. I, I, <laughs> hey, Stevie, where would you play in Vegas? Did you play at the Sahara, you told me, right? No, F Flamingo, Flamingo. Oh, you played the Flamingo. Okay. Yes, which was very exciting because I happened to catch, this is 73, I caught like the last year the mob was there. And uh, it was a really, it was, I'm really glad I saw it, you know, the, the difference because it's night and day from yeah. what you see now. Uh, I mean, there was, there was, you know, uh, I don't know, a quarter of a mile in between each casino. And, and uh, you know, they only made money from gambling. So... The rooms were, you know, $20, $30. Uh, you, you would have uh, these, uh, you know, the food, uh, what do you call those things, all you can eat, you know. Buffet, buffet. Uh, buffets for like two ninety five, and there'd be steak and lobster, you know. I mean, there was, you know, hookers everywhere. It was, it was paradise, you know. And they were discounted. And, and, the hookers were discounted in those days. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it was, it was te technically illegal in Las Vegas County. But uh, every, you know, doorman, the, you know, the valet. Yeah, you call the bellman. You call the bellman. They all had, yeah. they all, yeah. <laughs> they all they, had numbers. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but the point is, that even with the mobs probably skimming 25% off the top and making money from nothing, not from food, not from hotels, not from entertainment, the lounges were 5 $6. And Frank Sinatra might walk in, you know. Uh, so with them skimming 25% and, ha and making no money from anything, everybody got rich. They still got rich, you know? So, you know, you can see the difference. And then once, once the corporations took over, the whole thing changed and, uh, you know, it became a lot less fun. But I happened to, I happened to catch the last year, you know, of, of any, you know. So that was it, you know, after that I got back into music and um, came home, started Southside Johnny and Asbury Jukes. And then Bruce wanted to put the guitar down for a minute. Uh, he had seven gigs booked. Um, his first two records had not done well. So he was hanging out with us, with Southside Johnny and, and the Asbury Jukes. And we started a whole scene at this club called The Stone Pony and uh, had a real, really successful residency there three nights a week for a year or two. And, uh, and then he had, he had like seven gigs left. Uh, and he, he said, I want to put the guitar down, come come play guitar. So I, I, I went for seven gigs, like I say, and I, and I stayed for seven years. And um, and that was that. And then, and then I did my own records in the 80s. And uh, in the 90s, I was out of work. I was doing nothing. Uh, I kind of, I don't want to be too dramatic, but I kind of got blackballed after I did this record called Sun City. I got very, very political in the 80s very political. Uh, I mean, that's all I cared about. And we, we uh, attacked uh, this apartheid system in South Africa and basically helped bring the South African government down. And, you know, feeding people in Africa is one thing, you know, that's okay. But you start bringing governments down <laughs> and people get nervous. <laughs> so the record and, uh, companies, Stevie, the record companies, you feel blackballed you or you know they did? Well, I, I, had, I had four deals in negotiation when Sun City came out. And when we were very successful, we shut the Sun City Resort down and literally got Mandela out of jail. And we, and we, we ended the South African government's uh, apartheid system. All of a sudden, all four companies ran away, you know? And nobody wanted to sign me anymore. You know, so I figured that, that's that. You know, okay, you know, I accomplished at least something. And uh, I was walking my dog for seven years. Did you have any and, money, uh, Stevie, or were you broke? Did you have some dough? I was, I was broke uh, most of that time. Um, I produced a record, a comeback record for Southside Johnny and, and wrote most of the songs. And this publisher, Lance Freed, who was Alan Freed's son, uh, the famous DJ, DJ um, he heard the record and he, and he liked it so much, uh, he gave me a publishing deal. 
uh, which at that time it was, it was like a half a million dollars, you know, uh, and, and would save would save my life at the time. So so um, that kind of bridged the gap a little bit. And then uh, you know I, I I was inducting the Rascals in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and and David Chase was watching, and uh, you know they found me, uh, which was not easy because I had no company. And they found me through the corporate papers of my foundation at the time. Uh, and uh, that's George yeah, Ann, wow. George Ann and oh, what, George Ann and, 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 and Sheila, Sheila Jaffe. Yeah. Yeah, probably more George Ann, I think, on the East Coast. And they, they traced me down and called up. Hey, you wanna be in my new T V show? You know <laughs> I was like, Wow, what a what a nice compliment. But I said, No, no thanks, you know. Uh, he said, What do you mean no? I said, I'm not an actor. You know, I mean, I, I'd love to do it, but uh, I'm not an actor. And David Chase says, yes, you are an actor. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> so I said, okay. I, you know, and I went down and met with him. And, uh, you know, that was that, really. So he, you know, he, was a, is he, he was a big East Street band guy? He was a big fan? Yeah. He even, he even had my solo records. And uh, he, was a, he was a big music fan. And a Rascals he, fan, he did, obviously, too. Yeah. And a Rascals fan, but, but just judging from that little monologue I did inducting the Rascals, which was kind of a humorous, uh, you know, a little, little bit of comedy. It's probably on YouTube somewhere, like everything else in the world. Um, he saw that and said, you know, let's get him, let's get him in the show. I'm, I'm looking for new faces. And, uh, you know, it was a very ballsy move on his part, as you know. I mean, this guy is one of the ballsiest guys that's ever lived. I mean, sure. look at the crazy show he put together. You know? Now, now I mean, uh, you read for Tony, right? They wanted you for the lead. So, yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, so originally you read yeah. for Tony Soprano, and was it your, was it your idea, Stevie, to get the 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 wig and the the whole thing? Was that you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I figured, you know, I, I had I had lived through, you know, my wife, who's a real actor, uh, you know, going to going to acting school for years, and uh -huh. with a lot of heavyweights. You know, you'll you'll talk to her and you'll 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 see her story is quite extensive, and so. You know, I was experiencing the acting world through her, but 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 basically, I said, you know, I gotta create, I gotta create this guy uh, from the outside in, because I don't know any any other way to do this. Uh, so I I figured if I could if I could see and see the guy, then I could then I could be him. You know. Yeah, or you know. a lot of the clubs were owned by wise guys, no, Steve. Yeah, yeah, or, or, or wannabes. And to tell you the truth, what's the difference? You know, they're equally scary. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah so yeah, so yeah. you. Know, you know, you don't know whether it's a real thing or not, you know, but you weren't about to find yeah. out either, you know. No. Um, but Silvio you know, so, you know, had existed, right? You had written something yes. about Silvio yeah. Conte. So what, right? what happened was, so, 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 so David cast me as Tony. And we go to, we go to HBO, and, and, um, and HBO says to him, why are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> you know, this guy, this guy never acted. This is the biggest... Uh, you know, it's the biggest expense, you know, investment we've ever done. You know, uh, so they wouldn't they wouldn't let him cast me, and uh, and he says to me, um, you know, what else you want to do? You can do anything you want. You know, and I said, you know, now that I think about it, David, I mean, the whole thing's been so fast and so spontaneous. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I mean, once he offered it to me. I, I did design the guy. I, I found out when, where John Gotti had his clothes made. It was good timing because he had just gone to jail, so the tailor was available. And, and, and <laughs> I, uh, I ended up getting him hired for the Sopranos. He, he ended up becoming one of the Sopranos. Uh, yeah, I guys. think I went to him. I, the, the, yeah. Yeah, he made the show for me. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so, so you know. So I said, I said, David, tell you the truth. Now that I think about it, you know, let's just stop and catch our breath here for a minute. I said, I, I feel, I, I don't feel right about this. I don't, I don't really feel right about taking an actor's job. You know, these guys, just judging from my wife, you know, they go to class all the time. They do off, off Broadway. You know, they, 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 they go years trying to, trying to find a job. I said, I, I, don't, I don't feel that good about taking somebody's job. You know. He said, All right, I tell you what, then uh, you're not going to take anybody's job. I'm going to write you in a part. I'm going to write a part that doesn't exist. All right? How about that? I said, well, all right. He says, what do you want to do? 
I said, well, I got this, I got this treatment. It, it was a, it's, a, it's a full screenplay now. But at the time, it was just a treatment. And I said, I, got this, I had this idea for this, um, this uh, retired hitman named Silvio Dante who um, owns a club. And it's, it's more like a separate club, like a, you know, like a Copacabana. He kind of lives in the past. It's, a, it, it's set in present day, but it's, it's kind of set in, you know, he, he lives in the past a little bit. He, it's going to have like big band music, uh, chorus girls, you know, Catskill comics, you know, like the old days. And once you go into the club, you're like you're back in the in, back in the 50s, you know. He says, "Wow, that sounds good. Let me let me uh, let me let me talk to them." And he came back two days later. He says, "Nah, they they, they don't want to go. For, they, they don't want to spend the money. So we'll make it a strip club, you know." And uh, <laughs> and, and, you'll, right. you'll, and you'll and you'll and you'll run it for the family, yeah, you know. And uh, like that, you know. And so, so uh, you know, we ended up making them kind of. One one of one of Tony's main guys, and uh, and like you said, Michael. Uh, after after a little while, a very short time, you know, my real life, you know, started to get used by the writers and and by myself mentally. You know, it was kind of the job I, I did have with Bruce Springsteen for a long time as his right hand man, as consigliere, kind of the underboss job you know so i kind of i knew what the dynamics were in, in that relationship you know when you're the only guy who who's, who's going to bring the bad news you know to the boss right. because you know you're the only guy who doesn't fear him and so i was really able to use that and, and the writers picked up on it and david chase picked up on it and uh you know um, it kind of started happening more i think in the second season because the first season was just one big experiment you know by him and me, uh, you know, I wasn't sure I was going to like it. Uh, uh, the process is very, very strange for a musician. Uh, you know, Michael, you know, you're, 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 you're both things. And, and um, you know, uh, musicians, uh, I mean, we, we, you know, you go into a studio and, and, you, and you play and you, and you hear what you play, obviously, right? You're hearing what you're playing right. and you can adjust to whatever you need to adjust to, right? Acting you act and you see it six months later right. you know I mean, <laughs> yes you know you, you, you don't see what you're doing <laughs> you know which no, is you know, very you know. very strange okay <laughs> you know well, Stevie, uh, you know, don't you, you don't you don't you feel when you're on stage you you're performing and you are acting no don't you well, don't you feel that way i mean that, that it is the, uh, you know yes i mean i mean every 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 singer is an actor okay not necessarily right. you know you know you're, you're everybody's playing a role but but the, every singer is an actor and, and every song is a script yes and In a storyteller right it's telling a story and yes yeah yes. Without a doubt. yes but 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 you're but you but stevie your 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 life your career does not depend on uh what you what you look like you, you know what, what you're what you're seeing, you know, it, it's about the music that you're making, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. you know, uh, it's a different kind of communication entirely. I mean, I, you know, I, I guess similar to theater, you know, in, in that sense. But but TV acting or, or movie acting, you know, they don't want you looking at the monitors after you do a scene. You know, uh, you know no. that's not going to happen. You know, most of the time. Now, were so, you nervous, Stevie? The first day you come on, were you? You know, I, I, I mean, were you? I wasn't or, or, you know. I, I was kind of, uh, you know, it was all kind of surreal uh, until uh, we do that first table read, you know, and you know how it is, and and and, and um, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I'm 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 giving it all I, you know, I'm serious about it, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not taking it lightly. You're concerned. But it's all a little bit. It's a little bit surreal. You know what I mean? It's not quite real. Uh, I wouldn't say nervous as much as just, just you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't intelligent enough to be nervous. You know what I mean? Yeah. I wasn't smart enough to be nervous. You know, <laughs> I, I understand. You know, I understand. You know, you know, <laughs> I, didn't, you know, I didn't know enough to be nervous. So I was there, and, and, and I looked up, and across the table is Johnny Ola. Okay, and then everything changed for me. I was like, holy <laughs> shit. It's Johnny fucking Ola, you know? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, Dominic Chiesa, who, you know, you know, for those of us who are 
you know, and you don't have to be Italian American, but but you know, the Godfather, the the first two Godfather movies, anyway, are you know, are something that is just uh, extremely special, you know. And then there's there's Johnny Ola, you know, and. And I'm I'm acting in a in a show with Johnny Ola. It, it, I, 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 it was really a, a revelation to me. You know, at that point, it became very very real. And uh, and I, I know, but other than that, I, I had written a whole biography about the character. And um, and like I said, I really looked very different, very unrecognizable. So when I came out of that trailer, part of my part of my biography was was that he was fearless. So I came yeah. out. I was completely fearless on, on on the set. You know, I was I was that guy. You know, uh, so in that sense, I it's wasn't really nervous. What, what you said about the first season being an experiment, I don't think David expected it to go more than one season. <laughs> no, because <laughs> you know, he no, really didn't no. have ideas for the future. Because he was like, "We ain't no. going more than one season." No, no, yeah. that's true. So. His whole thing was, you know. Uh, oh, and I, I should I should tell you the one the one funny story. Um, you know, I, I went down to talk to him. He said, "Come on down," and we're just shooting the shit. You know, we're just talking. And I says, "You know, David, you know this is this is really a, a terrific script. You know, I see scripts all the time, not for acting, but for music. You know, and they always suck. I mean, always. You know, you know how it is getting. You know, you, know, you guys must get ten, ten, ten bad scripts. <laughs> you know, most of them. <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, this is really a good script, but I got to tell you one thing. I said, you know, I'm Italian. I grew up Italian. Most of my friends are Italian. You know, I, I don't think this mother is believable. You know, I, I never seen a, I, ne I never seen a mother like, like this. I mean, I've been in a hundred Italian households. You know, I said, yeah. I said, I don't know if people are gonna, you know, buy this mother. You know, and he goes. That's my mother. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, <laughs> Stevie, did uh, you did you uh, work with an acting? It coach? all made sense when he said that. Did you work with an acting coach, <laughs> or did Maureen help you? No, no, Maureen helped. Uh, not not a lot. I mean, going into the second season. Uh, Somebody, somebody said, you know, geez, you know, you, you, you ought to think about, you, you know, getting some acting uh, lessons just for the, you know, just for the hell of it. And I went to one class, you know, and so, and so, so now I'm, I'm observing the first season. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing what I'm doing, you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's like six, eight months later, you know, I'm like, oh, now I'm, I, now I get it. I get it. You know, I, I get the whole less is less is more thing you know because that's the only thing the directors would tell me in that first season was you know less do a little less do a little less you know less 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 and uh you know so i kept trying to you know you, you know the, you know the craft the craft is basically you know look like you're not acting <laughs> you know basically you know you gotta just you know and 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 so i started i started to see oh i you know i could see so i, I go to this class a regular, uh, you know, theater class, big shot theater class, you know, and and the, and the teachers, uh, there's like bleachers, and, and you know, and the teachers, you know, twenty feet away, and I start reading some monologue or something, and she's like, bigger, bigger, you know, <laughs> <laughs> louder, more, bigger, you know, and I, and, I, and and I said to myself, no, no, this is exactly what, what I don't need, you That's know. Sad, I don't need. <laughs> I, you would do a fine on your own. I got fired from my first play because I had been in acting class for years, you know, tried to get jobs in movies through, through the trade papers. But in my class, it was only about being honest and being truthful and using yourself. My teacher had no concerns about us being loud or theatrical or having the audience see you. So all of a sudden I'm doing this play and I have no technique in terms of vo I never studied voice. So yeah. basically I'm acting like I'm in a movie on a stage and they fired me and they just said, you know, <laughs> you, you, I had no concern about pace, no concern about like, you know, keeping it moving. And so I was just about trying to be honest. And they were like, you know, this play is four hours long the way you're doing it. Cause I was the lead. They said, this ain't going to work. And I didn't know how to do anything else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, but yeah. after the first season, after, after my first season, I went 
to an acting class, and I hated it. And I worked with someone the whole time, but one-on-one. I worked with an acting coach in East yeah. Village, one-on-one. I didn't like the class. That wasn't for me. You know, I, I didn't care for Yeah, that. I, I, think, I think those things would come in handy, like if you needed, like, a, you know, a dialect, you know, if you were if yeah. doing an accent, you know, uh, something like that. I think, you know, it would come in very handy, you know. You know. But... um. I just, you know, I just, I thought to myself, this is, this is exactly the wrong thing for me. I, I need to do less. I need to be smaller, you know, uh, I, you know, and, uh, you know, you, you just eventually get better. And, 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 and from, from you guys, from acting with you guys and, and, you know, Jimmy Gandolfini and, and you know, well, you uh, get like more I, like comfortable, said, you know, you get comfortable you, well, and comfortable well, you, you get, you, and you get better. You get better. I, I get better from watching, from watching you guys, you know. Stevie, uh, yeah. so the, I think season two, do you go back on? Is it season two or season three? You go back on the road with Springsteen, and you're juggling no. both. Yeah, yeah, right away. It was right after that first season. Uh, you know, I, I left the band. You know, took an 18 year hiatus. <laughs> you know, was it 18, 18 years? You weren't in the e, you weren't in East Street for 18 years. Yeah, yeah, I pro- I produced. Uh, Three quarters of Born in the USA, and then I left. Right. Uh, Eighty-two. Wow. Uh, wow. And, 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 I, and we went back, and he. And so, I finally got a new gig. I, you know, after all this time, I finally found. Okay, I'm. You know, this acting thing, I like it. You know, I'm gonna. I'm gonna learn about it, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna do this the rest of my life. You know, great. And then he decided to put the band back together. You know. Uh, so I was like, man, I had a real tough decision to make. And, um, you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, if I made the right decision or not. But, but um, I felt there was closure. I needed some closure because, you know, I left under kind of, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a little bit of a controversial time to leave when I left. And, you know, we needed to kind of have some closure there. Um, but... I did sacrifice. Um, I think I would have been more involved in Sopranos if I if I hadn't done that, because I wanted. I really was interested in writing and directing. I mean, that's that's one thing I've I've always been interested in, and I didn't get you know I didn't get a chance to do that until Lilyhammer, you know, after Sopranos. But um, but after the first season, um, you know, I, I decided to try and do both. And David Chase was great about it. He he, he booked my scenes on days off of the tour. Right. And I so flew home hard. every day. Yeah, every day. I remember that. I remember you flying back and forth and coming in and out. I mean, it was you were flying from different parts of all over the country at one point. You know, yeah. In and out. I, I, came home from, I flew home from Paris. Uh, one, wow. one, one, you know, for one, for, you know, you know, get off the plane from Paris. You know. Get uh, get all you know suited up. Go on, go on, get get out of the trailer. And I say, go fuck yourself. And I get back on the plane and go back to Paris. You know? <laughs> uh, Stevie, yeah. how involved you know. were you with the music? Did David come to you a lot? No, uh, no. He lo- he loved doing that. I mean, he loved that more than anything else. More than you know, literally. That's his favorite part of the show. Um, he only came to me when he needed something new. You know, he said, I need, I need something new. Or, or once, um, you know, Adriana opened up the, uh, uh, the club, you know, occasionally you need a band. So I would suggest a new band, you know. So we, we, we got a couple of bands in and a couple of songs. But uh, no, nah, he, he loved doing that. You know, you know what I loved about, uh, you know, we're watching it, Stevie, for the first time in 20 years since we did this. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, I, never, we're I never have done mm. Have you gone back and that. watched? No, no, I want to do that. I, I've never, I've never watched it from the beginning. Well, I, I got to tell that. you, you know, because you forget so much, and you know, we've been doing this since April, so, uh, you know, last April. So, you know, what I loved about Silvio, seriously, now, you know, you look back because you forgot. I mean, he had big giant balls. He took he care is of fearless, business. Like you said. Yeah, took care of fearless. fucking business, but he was very human. He had, you know, a daughter. He had his wife. He was very much a family guy, but he told Tony like it was, even uh, uh, ethical things, moral things, not just mobby things. You know, he gave his opinion. Uh, 
the episode, uh, it's called Eloise, where Paulie, you tell him off the record his attitude, and he gets shitty and he calls you a weasel, you know, calls you, and you got you stand up, you're ready to fucking go. I mean, the character was a, a great combo of a real take care of business mobster, do what he's got to do, kill when he's got to kill, and a very civil fucking human. Hey, you you, yeah, you, you blended about. that really nice, I, I, I'm telling you. Oh, thank you, thank you. It was, of course, it's in the writing, and and, and we, we talked at, at various points about, you know, he would be kind of the uh, ambassador, you know, of the family. You know, he would, he would go, you right. know, be able to go outside the family occasionally, you know, to make the deal with the Jewish guys, you know. Remember that, 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 that uh, arc, you know. Or yeah. uh, something like that, you know. Um, we're as opposed to a Tony Sirico type or, 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 or Vinnie Pastor, you know, those guys that were just so inside, you know, that they, they really couldn't relate to anything except the family, you know. They, you know yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And your character too, Michael, had, had, had a little bit of that, you know, that wanderlust, you know, that, 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 that you know, yeah. like, you know, reaching outside <laughs> to become a movie producer, or, you know, you know, but, but, yeah, you know, he, but most of the time, you know, the real old, old school guys, you know, they, they couldn't relate to anything except, uh, you know, the immediate family. So we talked about my guy being a little bit more, a little bit more worldly, a little bit, you know. It's also interesting, the episode when you kind of stand in for Tony for a little while and you realize pretty quickly that be, you know, being the boss is not, a, it's not a fit, you know, for Silvio. It was just no, like. No, no, I, just as in real life, you know, I, I, I prefer being the behind the scenes guy. I didn't want to become a solo artist ever in my life, you know. It just happened, you know. And then I got into politics and, you know, one thing led to another, you know. But I never, it's not my natural inclination. And I, and I, I think I was the only guy, you know, the only character on the show that didn't want to be the boss, you know. Uh, uh, exactly. Probably, was, yeah. You know, you yeah. know, and all of a sudden he started developing like uh, asthma or something. You know, asthma he started developing, <laughs> you know, allergies. You know, you know, but you know, you know what I, you know what I love, Stevie. Uh, you know, we see the guys at the club, and me and Michael have talked about this, right? We see the guys fucking around the club, breaking balls, the broads, the thing. But when it came to business, when Tony told Silvio or Paulie or Christopher this needed to be done. These guys make no mistake about it. They are flat out fucking murderers. They are killers. Oh, yeah. They are murderers. There's no, you know, yeah, we joked the strip club, but when it came to business, Silvio especially, boom, you know. Well, yeah, uh, you know, it was a very fine line and, 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 and quite brilliant, uh, I, I think, looking back, uh, about the, the real effort by David Chase to not romanticize this way of, of making a living, you know? He really went out of his way all, all he could to not romanticize it and show how boring it could be because that's what it really is, uh, I'm sure. And, and to, so, 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 to, so to show that this lifestyle was not romantic, you know, not not fun, uh, not exciting, and yet make it compelling for an audience. You know, that's that's quite a trick when you think about it. Right. You know, oh, sure. how, how do I how do you know how, how do I write something that's boring <laughs> and compelling? You know, at the same time, and, and, you know? uh, and really entertaining, and re you know, and people yeah. can't stop watching. <laughs> that's the thing, and, and, and it comes down to what, what I think is missing in today's TV. You know, uh, and I really am serious about this i really i really think what's missing today is, is character you know um the, so for some reason it became it became out of fashion you know when modern tv is all about premise weird premises and moods and environments and and, and uh, uh you know it's, it's about everything except character you know and, and i said this to, to to richard plepler when he when he was still at hbo and uh I, I'm, I'm like, you know, I look at TV. Who, who do you relate to? Who, who are you relating to on TV these days? Exactly. You know what I mean? What, what character? A zombie. You look zombies. At, you know, zombies are big, right? <laughs> yeah, zombies. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? I'm like, you know, and, and that's the one thing David Chase 
Uh, I mean, you could have had 14 spinoffs from The Sopranos, all right? And, and, and every single one of those spinoffs people would have watched. You know, the Bobby Bacala hour. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> With Janice. Been, been, it would have been a well, success. Well, he did. Uh, you know. David did entertain that exact idea, the Bacalas, as a sitcom. I remember him talking to me about it. You know, he did think about that at one point. Seriously. The Bacalas well, as a half-hour, like, sitcom, which would have been hilarious. I mean, if you think well, about Stevie, it. Lily Hammer was I mean, somewhat of that, no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a little, a little more humor, uh, a, little, a little lighter, because the, the Norwegians, you know, they didn't want any violence, you know. I I I made the most violent show in, in Norwegian history, that's for sure. Because you know? <laughs> I, I, I I said to them, I said, look, I made a deal with Netflix, you know, of course, which nobody had ever heard of because it was the first it was the first deal at Netflix. And I said, I said it's like HBO, which means you know people are uh, are subscribing to this network and they, they want to see you know. They want to see sex and violence and language and adult uh, entertainment. <laughs> Why are they paying, you know? And it was a very, very tough, uh, tough line to walk between making that audience happy and the and the family audience, which they sold to a network in Norway, was like their PBS. The so they were producers on it. The Norwegians were producers. No, 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 100% Norwegian production, except for me. 100%. Ah, okay. Every, so Netflix everything. came on as the studio. Uh, they bought the, the project. I, I go, they, they, they came to me. They said, we, we wrote a show for you, you know, and, uh, and it's a gangster who goes into witness protection in Lilyhammer. I was like, oh, man, I just played a gangster for 10 years. I, you know, I really shouldn't do this. Uh, but I couldn't resist, uh, you know, the, 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 the premise itself was just so wild to drop a, you know, one man crime wave into a country where there's no crime, you know? So I said, I, I can't resist. I can't resist the adventure of this, you know? And I, and I, and they made me one of the writers and one of the producers. And I, and I even directed the final episode. Uh, so I felt I, I could protect myself, you know, enough. And even though everybody tried to talk me out of it in the end, uh, oh, it was great. you know, we were able to, you know, we were able to great. make a really good show. It was show. a really good show. It, it was, was really, really fun. And, and, and it, so, it really entertaining. Stevie, that was Netflix's first original series? Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. They'd made wow. the deal for they they'd made the deal for House of Cards, but I think the um the production got delayed, you know. So we were the first show on, on Netflix. And and when wow. I when I did no, my they first were... promo tour, you know, I had I had to explain to people what Netflix was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stevie, they, what they were like, you work mostly with Jim. Right? Uh, uh, look, we yeah. all have our gym stories. What was that like? A lot of fun? Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we had a lot of, yeah. we had so yes. many fucking crazy times, all of us. I can't, do you mean? <laughs> How much time you got here? Uh, what about the appearance I mean, at the Lake Tahoe? <laughs> <laughs> Remember the four of us went to Lake Tahoe. Yeah. Oh, forget about it. We, but, we, 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 were, we were outgrossing, you know, heavyweight fights. I mean, it was an amazing, uh, amazingly successful casino run we had there. But uh, I was, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I'll always be grateful to him. Uh, you know, we, we bonded I, 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 right away, I, I think, because... Um, he was, a, I think he was at heart a character actor, you know? I don't, I don't think he ever really felt comfortable being the lead guy. I mean, he would very often grab me and bring me to a mirror and say, look at this mirror. You believe they cast me as the lead in this thing? Look at his face, look at his face, you know? And, 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 he, and he was only half joking. I mean, you know, he, wow. he really, you know, he was, a, he was a little bit of a side man, more comfortable as a side man, if you will, you know, as a character actor. and. Uh, and um, and so you know some of the scenes with him. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, it was just amazing. He was an amazing acting school all by himself. I mean, I literally would walk away from those scenes. I, I was twice as good an actor as, as you know. But but you know, he had a lot of conflicts about it. And um, and then just a couple of weeks in, uh, he started. And we you know we'd be talking, and he's like, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. I got, you know, and uh, you know, he, he he had gone from, you know, movies of what, what two pages a day to seven pages a day, 
uh, and, and five of the pages were him. You know. Yeah. I mean, every day you can imagine. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I mean, you know, I, I was struggling with my one paragraph. Uh, you know, he had a, he had a yeah. and we would work from you know six a.m. to ten p.m. A lot <laughs> of know? pressure. Yeah. A lot he of goes pressure. home. He's got to learn. He's got to learn seven pages. You know. Uh, he was like, I, I can't, I can't do this. And, uh, for nine and months. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nine yeah, months. Yeah. Hey, so we, we would go to a bar, uh, <laughs> as we all, we all would occasionally go to the bar with him. Uh, you know, and we would have the same conversation really every month. And I'd say, okay, Jimmy, you know, how many good movies you see last year? You know, well, there was 10, you know, uh, you know, can you imagine being in more than one of those? No, that'd be good. I said, well, do that movie in between seasons of The Sopranos yeah. because you know, you, you know, you, you're not gonna, you know, you can't, you can't walk away from this gig. If this gig is is too, is this is the greatest gig in the world, even though it's impossible to do, if you can hang in there. I said, you're still gonna do the same amount of movies, you know, and and that's what he ended up really doing. I mean, he. He almost did a movie a year, really, you know. Uh, yeah, on the hiatus. But he would quit. He would. He would. He would quit every every week. He's quit. He's, he's quitting. And uh, but then he called you know, they... once in a while. Once in a while, he wouldn't. You know, he'd be he'd be gone for three to four days. Yeah. He says, you know. And then he you called know. David up like in the middle of the night one time, screaming and yelling. I think uh, Jimmy. Uh, yeah, Jimmy really? called. Uh, I, yeah, I would not be surprised. Him. Yeah. Yeah, early I'm on, yeah, I think the first season. Uh, Stevie, who was your first? Uh, who was your favorite character on The Sopranos? Oh, I don't know. I, I uh, um, I, I always loved the uh, what, what, what's it? What, when what's the word uh, when you uh, when you say the wrong words? You know. Uh, oh, uh, malaprops. Yeah, Malaprop. Who, who what, was that? Uh, Ray Abruzzo, Little Carmine, Carmine Junior. Little Carmine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Little I, Carmine. I, I just get a kick out of that. That's I'm, I'm a sucker He's for that hilarious. stick. You know, you know. I did, yeah. and uh, Artie, Artie, Artie Bucco also. You know, Johnny, Johnny Vittimilli. Some once in a while, he would just have an expression that you, you, you just you really had to fight not <laughs> yeah. to break up laughing. I mean, you know, his oh, physicality. But, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the over yeah. he he reminded me of Vito Scotti. You remember, remember Vito Scotti? Yeah, you know, sure. the great the, you the know, Godfather. The, 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 like that. Yeah. 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 That's but, who but, he based Artie Bucco on. Johnny said that. On he came on and told us. Oh that. he did he did say he that. Based Artie on that character, the baker in The Godfather, yeah. That oh, he couldn't get out of the room. He, did, he, he, he did a million things. Yeah. Remember he was on the Lucy show, he was on all them. I grew up with him. He was on uh he was on uh, one of them, one of the kids' shows, uh, either Howdy Doody or or, uh, or um, Andy's Gang, Andy's Gang, Andy Devine. Oh, oh Andy, Andy Devine. Andy Devine. He was uh, he was he was on he was a regular, you know. So I grew up with him, and uh, but I, and, yeah, and and Johnny had that thing. Oh, I, I never really realized he was doing that intentionally, but <laughs> it was did. a great choice if you think about it. I mean, I can't imagine any actor doing that part. It could have been a nothing role, really, unless, you know, yeah. it, what Johnny brought to that was so much in every scene. You know, it's amazing. Really, that, that's, that's a fact. He, he, really, he really turned that thing into something special and uh, uh, hilarious. One yeah. of hilarious. my favorite moments uh, we had when we went, Stevie, me, you, Michael, and Jim, go to Chicago in the casino, and then we go out to Buddy Guys, you who very rarely drinks, you had a few wines in you, and then you got up, and we were breaking your balls, and you got up and played with the band. And it was one well, of those moments, and I'm yeah, not bullshitting. Yeah, that was amazing. It was like, I can't believe I'm seeing this. You know, <laughs> you had the fucking guitar, you went, you talked to the band, you whispered, and we're in the club, and you're fucking, it was unbelievable. Remember that, Mike? <laughs> That was a great night, yeah. That was incredible. And then we moved on with the private plane to Tahoe, and that got very ugly, and on the way home, and on and on and on. That was ugly. Yeah. It was a very Rat Packy vibe when we would travel like that to the casinos. Very much that, you know. I mean. Yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun, really. Uh, you know. And I remember, Stevie, at the, the finale, even you down at the Hard Rock, 
when the 10,000 people were in the casino, even you said, holy shit, and you've seen it all. I mean, you've played, what, in front of 100,000 people. No? I know, but I, I told Jimmy and, 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 and everybody, I said, if, if you want to wonder what, what it felt like to be a rock star, here it is. This is it, you know? Uh, and the Sopranos really were, you know, in many ways, I think the first rock stars of TV. I, I mean, I, I'd never seen anything like that. Nobody had, you know, I don't, you know. That was crazy I, down there. That was crazy. Oh, that was it. That was really crazy. Hollywood, Hollywood Florida. Yeah. And, and I, we, I had to go on the I had to go on the radio the next morning. Uh, well, my affiliate, you know, I, my radio show has a, uh, you know, whatever it is, a hundred affiliates, and uh, and I just happened to book my affiliate the next morning, and it's one of those national, you know, some radio shows are national, you know. Yeah. It was one of those national syndicated shows, and. Uh, after that controversial ending, right? I had to hear from the whole country, you know, how pissed off they were and upset, you know. And and, and I finally I started I started you know fighting fighting back. I was like, okay, let me hear your great ending. I said, yeah. you know, right, exactly. Did you, did you want Did you want Jimmy to die? No. Did you want the wife to die? No. Do you want one of the kids to die? Well, no. Uh, you know, you know. I said, all right. So what, what what's the great ending? You know. That you in your head, and by the end of that radio show, you know, I kind of was making some progress. They were like, "Well, man, maybe, maybe, maybe that ending was the right ending after all." You know, we. Uh, uh, I think I woke up at two o'clock in the afternoon that day. I was fucking hurting. <laughs> God damn! What I don't know what where I got. I, I used to have stamina. Way, man, I can't even have a drink anymore. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yeah, that Bailey ending drinks. took a lot of guts, a lot of balls to do do, do what David did, and it was, I, to me it was brilliant. I mean, I I always felt that yeah. way. I I st I'm still not sure exactly. You know, I, last time we David was on this show and we were talking about it, and I said, you know, I I've kind of I went to different extremes. I thought he was dead. I thought he was alive. And then I'm like, you know, it's kind of like a book. When the book is over, the book is over. You close the book. It's not like what happened. At, it's over. That's the end. That's what it. you see is the end. And that's it. That's what it, do you, you think know? happened, Stevie? What do you think happened? Well, I remember, you know, uh, remember that Vanity Fair article they did on us, uh, you, you know, years after the show. Yeah. There's there a big magazine article about it. And uh, I think I ended the article, you know, I, I said to them, I'm going to, uh, all right, enough of the rumors. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened, you know. And, 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 and the reporter, you know, got real serious. You know? I said, you know, I'll tell you what happened. The director yelled cut, and the actors went home. You know, that's how it ended. You know, and, uh, I think he's alive and well. I think Tony Soprano's well, alive too. and well. That's my uh, 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 Stevie. Tell us about uh, Underground Garage. How many years has it been? Your uh, radio show on Sirius. When I, I, I sent, I made, I made uh, three hundred and fifty uh, demo tapes of the radio show and sent them out. And they landed on every radio uh, show, radio station's desks on 9-11, uh, the, the morning of 9-11. So what's wow. that, 2001, yeah. right? Yeah. Wow. 2001, 2002? Uh, 2001. 2001. Literally, 9-11, 2001 this is the day my radio show arrived. And uh, so, you know, it took a minute before people uh, started thinking about radio again. Uh, but uh, within six months, I mean, everybody turned it down, and uh, they said you can't do uh, 50, 60 years of music in one place. You can't combine the things you want to combine. You know, you can't combine blues with rock, and you know, soul music. You can't do it. You know, and I'm like, you're totally wrong. I know what I'm doing. I live this. This is my life. You know what I mean? You, you know, and and so uh, in the end, I realized, you know, I'm talking to the program directors, and that's really not the right. You know, this is America. What's America all about? Money, right? So I started talking to the general managers, and I said, uh, let me let me ask you something. If I sold out my radio show for a year, would you let your program director put it on? And they were like, sure. You know. Program director sold out meaning, meaning having sponsors. Is that what you mean? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and 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 radio in those days, and, and still they they sell they sell their sponsorships like by the week, uh, at the most by the month. You know, I'm like that's a crazy way to do business. I said I'm gonna I'm gonna sell by the year. 
you know, what? why do I want to, I don't want to do this every day, you know. So my first 20 stations, I sold out the sponsorship for a year. And that's how I got my first 20 stations. And then it started to catch on. And it started to catch on, you know. And then I ended up, uh, at one point, I was like, I don't know, I got to like 150, 160 stations. I think it's it's probably half of that now, but I'm in 100 countries now because it's on uh, Voice of America. It's on all, all the uh, all the military bases, you know. And you have and then, your and own don't you have your own yeah, channel, Stevie? Don't you have your phone yeah, channel, Stevie? Like, they, they came along about, I don't know, I was on the year, I don't know, three, four years. And then Sirius Satellite came along. And I got, I'm still the only person with two stations. I got, I got my, my uh, underground garage station 24-7 and Outlaw Country on Channel 60. Um, you know, but... Um, I mean, they, they came along really just in time because radio has become very, very conservative. And, um, you know, where are you going to hear? Where are you going to hear Frank Sinatra? You know, yeah. where, where, where are you going to hear uh, blues? Where are you going to hear jazz? Where are you going to hear the Beatles? You know, uh, it, it, it all, you know, Sirius Island has become the depository, you know, the, the, the museum for the greatest music that's ever been made. And, and uh, so they came along just in time. Yeah. And speaking of Sinatra, he played Sun City Resort, huh? Yeah, yeah, he, he yeah he did, and uh, and they and they were they were they were fooling a lot of people, you know. You you can't really blame them because they had a big big uh, propaganda machine going, and they yeah. would offer they'd offer two million dollars in those days for a two week engagement. That's a lot of money. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, millions of dollars, and and you know, some of the wise ones. You know, a little bit, a little bit wiser. You know, turned them down, but a lot of people didn't. But that's why I didn't want to. I didn't want to divide the music business that way, and, and into who played and who didn't. You know, I said let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume that they were they were lied to, and and, and you know, and bought it. Yeah. And then let's let's start fresh from now on. You know, just say you're not going to go back to Sun City. And that's what, you know, I met with Queen. I met with a lot of people who had played. And they all agreed not to go back. And uh, we shut them down. Uh, you know, we shut them down completely. You know, uh, it was a complete, a complete rare, a rare, complete, complete victory. That's amazing. And are you still touring? Yeah. Are you touring? Uh, I mean, not now, of course, no. but, but you were. Well, my, my, right, yeah, right before the quarantine, right before this ridiculous zombie apocalypse, uh, uh, I had the most productive three years of my life. Uh, I, I put out five album packages in the last three years. I did. Uh, uh, I put out my Lily Hammer score. I put out all my catalog, Rock and Roll Rebel, it's called. And we have the Summer of Sorcery tour coming out in June. And this past week, I released um, Macca to Mecca, which is our Beatles tribute we did on the last tour. Uh, uh, we played the Cavern club where the beatles uh, played and uh, liverpool uh, they yeah in liverpool i had been in a beatle mood because uh, the, the very first show of the tour uh paul mccartney had come on stage with me and, and uh you know and and this was after i had fulfilled one of my previous dreams of a lifetime i filmed the irishman with scorsese the night before fly to london and now my first gig of the English tour, Paul McCartney comes on stage. Uh, I heard he was coming. And then over the last five minutes of the sound check, I said, let's prepare something just in case. And I did a, uh, like a Little Richard uh, arrangement of, of I Saw Her Standing There. Uh, and, and, uh, and he came and, and, you know, and I said, Paul, you know, you, you, never, you never go out. You're working all the time these days. You know, you, you really don't socialize much. I said, just relax tonight. Don't even think about coming up, you know, no obligation. Um, you know, because he, he had come up on stage with, with, with the E Street Band at Hyde Park, which was thrilling. And then he invited me and Bruce on stage with him at Madison Square Garden, which was thrilling. And so, you know, uh, I said, just relax tonight. You know, you'll sit, you and Nancy, you sit with Maureen. And we're taking the bow for the encore. And my roadie runs up and says, Paul's coming on. I was like, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> And he came up with a guitar, no rehearsal, and he just 
trusted me and trusted the band. And we did, uh, we, we went into this little Richard version of I Saw Her Standing There, uh, you know, and it was one of the most amazed, amazing moments of my life. I mean, my, the first album I ever bought was, yeah. was Meet the Beatles, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, endorsing these three bands is one thing, but endorsing me and my music, you know, trusting my band, uh, that's a whole nother matter, you know, and, and that was extraordinary. So it put me in a very Beatley mood anyway, that tour. And then we're playing Liverpool, which, you know, obviously is going to put you in a Beatle mood. And so we, we did this lunchtime set, and it just came out this week, and we're going to also add it to the Soul Fire Live package, so you can get it either way. Did a get lot it on of people show? Well, the, the Cavern, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the one film from the Cavern. It's a very narrow club. Um, probably two, three hundred people pack it. Pack it. Very narrow, and it's and, and it's these arches, the very famous arches above the stage. Now, when I first got to England, I run to Liverpool, you know, because, you know, this is, this is literally my religion, and, and Liverpool is my mecca, right? So I run to, I run to the address they, they gave me, the uh, cavern, and I, and I get there, and I'm like, it's a parking lot, you know? And I asked somebody walking by, I said, where, where's the cavern? Where's the cavern, you know? The most famous club in the world. They said, oh, yeah, we paved over that. So, in somebody's oh boy. entrepreneurial wisdom, they had paved over at the Cavern Club, and then finally somebody figured it out. Maybe, maybe there's something you know worthwhile about bringing this thing back, and they rebuilt it very close to where it was, and supposedly even with the same bricks. Who knows? But when they rebuilt it, they rebuilt the original-looking long tunnel with the arches, and then there's a hallway, and then there's a bigger room. That's where Paul McCartney played when he plays the Cavern. That's where, you know, most bands play. And they assumed that I would play there because I got a 15-piece band, right? You know. And I was like, no, no, no. I, I got to have the Arches, man. You know, I mean, the Arches is what I grew up seeing. You know, the Beatles <laughs> playing with the Arches. Are you releasing all this on your own label, Steve? All, all, all these works? Or yes. Is, or but, is it with yes. A, um, it's, all, it's all Wicked Cool, uh, but, but distributed by Universal, so. It, it, it's a, it's you know one of the two biggest record companies in the world distributed. Oh, that's good. But yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's all it's, a, it's my label through them. So yeah, all my stuff's available in every format worldwide. That's what I wanted, you know. I said, you know, yeah, I don't need a lot of money. Just make sure that my stuff is available physically, because a lot right. of people, you know, still love vinyl, you know, and so, still love CDs. You know, uh, so I wanted to make sure that my stuff was available physically as well as digitally and uh, and worldwide. So it's been the most productive three years of my life. And uh, and, and I, I stopped the tour um, assuming the E Street Band was going to tour uh, 2020. And I said, we, you know, we, have, we have to have time to do the new record. So I stopped the tour in November, the first week of November. Figuring, you know, we spent a couple months making a record and then be ready for the summer of 2020 to go out, you know, with the new E Street Band record. And, um, and so Bruce booked everybody uh, for five days. And I was thinking, no, he wants, he wants to just get a feel for what's going on, you know, and then we'll, and then we'll really get into the record. Uh, we ended up making the record in four days. The fifth day, we had nothing to do. Uh, you know, we sat around drinking tequila. Uh, it was incredible. So the entire the entire letter to you, the the new E Street Band album, got done in, in literally four days. In four days. And, wow. Yeah. And 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 then and then and then thank God we got it done before the quarantine hit. You know. Um, you think you're gonna tour so that, again with them, Steve? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, one I really, more tour. Um, yeah, yeah. I I think probably 22. You know. Mm. Well, that's what it feels like right now. 21 is still a little up in the air, you know. I'm with you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. South African variant and all of this, you know, stupid yeah, shit. Yeah, nobody knows. You yeah. know, yeah. It's a little it's a little hard to predict what the hell's going to happen here, really. You know, you know, but, yeah. So I think 22, I hope, is a safer bet. But um, but thank God we, we got it because we, we, rec we recorded it the old-fashioned, the old-school way of being in one room. And and uh, 
you know, Bruce just walked in with acoustic guitar, and and uh, and we did it on what I call the Beatles schedule, which was, you know, from the moment he started playing the acoustic guitar to the moment we were done was about three hours a song, you know. And, and uh, that's what the Beatles used to do, you know, in the old days. So it was, it was a funny, a f fun way to do it, and it kept it kept it very, very fresh and and fun, you know. And then the the very last day before the quarantine, uh, I got a chance to visit. You know, my my I have this curriculum, I have this education curriculum and and uh, a music history curriculum, and, and uh, we've been it's been it's been growing and growing. We have about 40,000 teachers registered using it. But um, the, day, the day before uh, the quarantine, uh, I visited our first partner school. And I saw kids from kindergarten to sixth grade all using uh, our curriculum. It's one of the most uh, amazing moments of my life, seeing, you know, I've been working on this for 15 years, and uh, to see it come to life like that. And basically, wow. it's, it's all about getting integrating the arts into the school system simple as that really you know and it changes everything it cha it makes it fun for the kids and you see the enthusiasm it's it's amazing it's amazing so that was literally the day before the quarantine so we got the East Street band record done and we and we got our first partner school of uh, of our education uh, wow. teach rock you're doing work, it you know. Stevie yeah try and stay you know stay busy right thank you so um, much and hopefully we'll see you sooner yeah, or later huh yeah, man. I'll see you soon, so. man. Take, Take care. care of yourself. All right. Good to see you. Love you. Thank you, man. Bye-bye. Right. Right. Love you, too. Stevie Van Zandt. Stevie Van Zandt. There's nothing else the to say. The legend himself. Incredible, the things nothing he's doing. Nothing else to say. That's it. And uh, there is nothing the else to say. The things he's done. Jesus. Yeah. He's lived 20 lives, this guy. Brilliant. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. And then uh, let's take a break. We'll get back into the episode, man. Uh, I just read the final draft of our book. Steve and I have written a book with the great Phil Lerman, who also worked with us on the, you know, who worked with us on the book. It's called Woke Up This Morning, and this is the definitive oral, oral history. history of The Sopranos. It is, it really blew me away. I, I you know, the final product, it's, the voices of the people who made this show and it's directly from that uh and i think the fans it's coming out november 2nd november 2nd as of now about 500 pages it's a big one and a lot of pictures is, personal pictures it's a must for any soprano fan and it, i think it's going to stand as the definitive document of the show it's it's, it's 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 great way more uh, it stems from our podcast, but so much more. 40, 50% new material. Uh, you hear from a lot of the people that were on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's uh, and, you know, not to toot our own horn, but it's really good. This is the book. Yeah. No one else could have wrote it. I'll be honest. And I am tooting our horn because no one else but me and you, Phil did a great job steering the ship, but no one else was there like we were. And no one uh, could have wrote the book like we did. We've got yeah. inside stuff, inside dirt, behind the scenes, great stories, all of our great cast. Right from their mouths. Participated. And, uh, you, the, you fans are going to really love this. This uh, isn't you know. hearsay. Yeah. This isn't someone who covered the show. This isn't someone who wrote for the paper or wrote an internet It's uh, not a critic. Uh, it's not a professor. It's this is us. It's from the team. People that were there, which is what made us do it in the first place, right. which made us do this podcast. We were there. This isn't hearsay. And you're going to get it all, and uh, I think it's very enjoyable, yeah, and I no, think you're going to like it. I was it. really... Uh, I love the title, Woke Up This Morning, the uh, definitive oral history of The Sopranos. Yeah, so uh, look for that, folks. Coming soon. All right, here we are, season five, episode seven. Boy, it's ticking off. Ticking off. It's like in one of them movies, you know, when the clock That's, goes round and round and round. Originally aired April 18th, 2004 in Camelot, of course, referring to the JFK administration. Camelot, we know, was uh, the kingdom of King Arthur. Uh, and a lot of it's about this whole 
mythology, mythologizing the past, mythologizing Kennedy, mythologizing Johnny Soprano and what went on before. Written by Terry Winter, eight of the 19 that he wrote, directed by Steve Buscemi. Now, do you, are you, Three a, out of his four. are you a JFK fan? Um, I can't say I'm a fan. I mean, I, I love, um, I love Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. I don't know how true that is, but I, I find it to be a really entertaining movie. Um, I think, what do you think about the assassination? Do you think it was a lone gunman theory? Do you believe it was a conspiracy? Or what's your... You know, I mean, I just think if if there was people involved, other people, I think someone put him up to it. I don't think there was more than one shooter. I you think, don't think there was more than one shooter? No, I think it, I, I think, and I could be way off base, folks, but I think, you know, the mob, uh, you know, uh, JFK's father went to the mob and to Sinatra and Sam Giancana and uh, got them to help uh, put him in office. And then he turned their back on them. He and turned his back. Kennedy turned, turned his, his back, back on, on them. Mob. Robert Kennedy went after them with a vengeance. Well, the Cuba thing was a problem, right? That was, you know, the mob had all those interests in Cuba. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Could this, could this Oswald do that? I mean, out of nowhere. And then Jack Ruby kills him, and he's gone. It's just too weird. I think there was probably you know, some funky, some weird stuff going on. The there. Bay of Pigs, the Bay of Pigs. I tell you a funny story. A friend of mine's father was a flag waving Italian. A beautiful guy. Beautiful. An American flag waving, not an Italian flag. Yeah, waving. like a. Flag waving guy, but just really proud of his Italian heritage. He was grew up in the neighborhood. He's a beautiful guy that I really liked. I knew him well. But what flag is father. he waving? The U.S. Well, or like the Italian? Italian? You know, I'm saying he's Italian. Italian flag. Yeah. Okay. Italian flag guy. He's an American Italian. So he goes to an Italian resort upstate, the Catskills, and uh, the guy is an Italian guy. You know, it's one of the Italian resorts. Villa Roma? I'm not sure if it's Villa one Roma, but like that. Yeah. may very well be Villa Roma. I'm going back. This is in the 70s. And the guy's t telling insulting Italian jokes. You know, all the Who Italian... The comedian? The comedian. You know, uh, why so many Italians named Tony... You know, because when they landed at Ellis Island, they go stamp to New York, to New York, you know, all that. Uh, then the other one, why do guys like to look like their uh, Italian guys wear mustaches? They want to look like their mothers. You know, all these insulting things. And he's fucking steaming. This guy's steaming. He ain't taking the joke. And the final joke, he says, what do you call a bunch of women, Italian women in a jacuzzi? And the punchline is the Bay of Pigs. And this guy goes crazy. Wow. Rushes the stage. Starts choking. The, no way. Choking the oh comic. I swear. This is a, a thousand percent true story. On stage choking. On stage the choking the guys. They were asked to leave the resort. Beautiful guy. Just could not take it. Could wow. not take it. The guy was him. The guy was relentless. Good, yeah. And uh, that was it. That's great. He, he deserved it. That beautiful, guy. beautiful uh, friend of mine. Good, and, and good a story. Good man. I think there was a conspiracy. I, I, I think this. It was. I think he was a patsy, basically Oswald and and Ruby set up, and Ruby was somehow paid. Or I don't know. That's just a little too friggin' weird. That whole story. And um, but that said, this is the same team, writing, directing team that did the Pine Barrens. Terry Winter, Steve Buscemi. And this episode, I love this episode. We meet Fran Felstein, who's Johnny Soprano, Tony Soprano's father's girlfriend, mistress, Gumad, played by Polly Bergen. Now, Polly Bergen died in 2014 at the age of 84. She had her own variety show in 1957, the Polly Bergen show. Oh, really? She starred as uh, Gregory Peck's wife in the original Cape Fear with Robert Mitchum. She did, she was the female lead in three Jerry Lewis, Dean Martin films, The Stooge, That's My Boy, and At War with the Army. Much later, she was in Cry Baby, directed by John Waters, starring Johnny Depp. She won the Tony Award 
for the play Follies in 2001. So she had a hell of a career. Hell of a career and a great lady. I got to meet her on set one day and I really liked her. And I think she does a really great job as a yeah. character. She yeah. nails it. She totally yeah. nails it. Well, she plays his uh, Gumada, you know, uh, uh, Johnny Boy's Gumada. Still looks good for a woman of her age. Still looks good and, and, and really nailed this part. I mean, I believe her as his character completely. Uh, I agree. Tony's house. Uh, Sunday dinner. Tony and Janice are talking. Those keep those kids seem to like you, sort of. Uh, I leave them completely free to do whatever they want. How else are they going to learn from their mistakes? And what does she she means by that? Is she's a bad? She player. doesn't want to be bothered. <laughs> she's crazy. She brings burgers. I mean, I tell you this. I ate. I don't know, five, six, seven cheeseburgers. They were so fucking good. They look good. They were so good. They look juicy and thick. And me and Jim knocked down a bunch of burgers uh, getting, you know, into the scene. Uh, She brings uh, burgers to Sophia, Bobby Jr., Bobby. A little, there's a lot of little specifics in this one. As Tony and Janice are talking, the kids seem like no cheese for Sophia. It means nothing. It's just a real moment. Right. Janice says no cheese for Sophia. That's what people do. Also, the whole laying the track for the dog. They're watching the movie Beethoven, which is about a dog. They bring up the dog that they used to own, Tippy. And later on, that comes into play in the episode. In a very important way, the kids want to get a dog. They'll clean up, you know, take him out to pee. And she says, and it's very undermining and humiliating and embarrassing to the kid. Pee, start with your underwear. Yeah, I, I want to pick up the poo and the pee. Start with your underwear. Bobby gives her a little look. Uh, Jim said to me, I, at some point during this, uh, did you ever have a dog that died? So Jim had a dog, and I can't think of his name, when he was a kid, that died. And he was... Dookie, wasn't it? Maybe it was. This was a dookie. You know, this. they said they had a dog named Tippy, and they had to take him to the country. And he believed the father took him to the country and put him on this farm. We had, a, for a while, we lived about an hour away from New York, in, in Brewster, New York. We had a backyard. And one day, this we were young. My brother and I were like 10 or 11. And he was a little younger than me. A dog shows up, stray dog in the yard. And wants to stay and is playing with a friendly, you know, and we kind of liked, and he kind of was staying outside every day. So, and one day my uh, father said, we had to take him to a farm. We can't, we can't keep the dog. You know, I'm allergic. The mother's allergic. And he said, we took him up to a farm in the next town. That's what they used to tell everybody. Yeah, wow. Well, put the dog in the farm. I got one for you. What turns out, you know what he did? He drove him, I don't know how many miles away let and just go. let him out of the car. Yeah. Hopefully you got a good home. We had a rabbit. At Wait, you have a rabbit named Paul. Paul. Right? Paul, that's my daughter's rabbit. But when I Why was, is his name Paul again? She adopted him. He came with that name. But why Paul? I don't know. It's he, a he very adopted. I tell you, it, Paul is a very weird name for a rabbit. Listen to me. It's like adopting a kid. They come with a name. This the, the the dog came with the name. I mean the rabbit came with the Does name. Does the rabbit answer to Paul? Like when you say yeah. Paul, he looks? Yeah. Yeah, he does. He's much smarter than you think. They're smart, these fuckers. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. She's had them for three and a half years. Are they smarter than people, do you think, or no? We're going to stop. We're gonna stop. I'm just this asking again. you. You're, no, you know a lot about rabbits. Hey, the rabbit's absolutely not smart. Do you get along with the rabbit? I get along Do you with feed him? Yeah, I feed him. Change the, clean the, the tank? No, I don't clean anything. Cage? He doesn't live in my house. When she's away or something, she taught me how to... Give him his food, his pellets, his uh, celery, whatever he eats. We should have him on uh, carrots, don't they? No, he doesn't eat carrots. What do you mean he doesn't eat carrots? This particular, I don't know if rabbits eat carrots. They all eat carrots. He doesn't. He eats celery. I mean, that's been proven. He eats celery. Willie likes his celery. Willie and him get along good. Willie boy. Uh, and Paul was at all my rabbits house. like carrots, Steve. We've seen that on Bugs Bunny. I don't think, We've seen that forever. I don't I think mean, this come one. Come on. You said he's a little off. Maybe something's Same wrong. Same as Paul. Paul. He likes celery. But so we had this rabbit. We got it as a kid. Remember during uh, years ago? I don't know if they still do it. You get the little chicks. Yeah. They're colored yeah. pink and blue and yellow. And you get these little chicks. The marshmallows. No, 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 no. Real ones. Real ones. Blue? What blue. blue. They died. They used to dye them blue. Who did? The people that you bought them from. And they're like the store. <laughs> 
I swear to God. How about blue chickens? Little chicks, colored, yellow, blue, pink. No, they are yellow. They would come this way. Okay, and they would buy you them, and then they would buy the rabbit store in Easter. And you color them? No, it wasn't colored. So we had one. I don't know who named it. Not very inventive. I'm not making this up. The rabbit's name was Sniffy. <laughs> All right? The rabbit's name was Sniffy. So we had the rabbit. We had it. You know, Easter's the big thing. Everyone's petting the rabbit, but it was domesticated. It's in the box. But now the rabbit's starting to get big. It's hopping out of the box. I don't know, maybe it's a month later. They say, we're giving it to Mrs. Parmese, who was my grandmother's best friend. She lived around the corner. We get, Mrs. Parmese's going to bring it up on her farm. Did Second, she have a farm? She had a she farm. She did have a farm. Upstate. Okay. There you go. Mrs. Parmese, I see her maybe two months later. I'm maybe 10, 11. I'm on my grandmother's block. Hey, Mrs. Parmese, how are you? Hey, Stephen, ba 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 ba. How's the rabbit? How's, How's the rabbit doing? He was delicious, she said. Oh, my God. How old were you? 10. You must have been traumatized. <laughs> For real. For real. Yeah. She ate the fucking rabbit. She ate your pet. She ate the pet. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, it wasn't a long term pet that you had yeah, for years, yeah, but yeah. still. It's just wrong. But it was the old, you yeah. know, up to the farm. And yeah. Bobby says, Bobby says, yeah, they all say that. They must have shit up to the rafters, you know. Uh, there must be 8 million dogs there, whatever he says. Uh, it's true. Uh, they all say that. The yeah. Tippy had worms. They took it to the farm. Janice, he was gas, Tony. He was delicious. You're so, <laughs> <laughs> you're so cynical. <laughs> Uh, you know, he's so cynical. Bobby says, 17 billion dogs out there. Uh, Tony don't want to believe that. He was gassed. The, the dog was gassed. Of course he was. Like, uh, Aunt Conchette's. Well, we find out he wasn't gassed, but that certainly could have been the reality. And he gets the call, Aunt Conchette died. I have a cousin Conchette in Italy, in Rome. Is it uh, short for Conchetta? Conchetta, yeah. Uh, Uncle Zio found her on the couch after Meet the Press. Another little tidbit yeah, there. Really Meet good. the Press. It wasn't just that she was dead. She had a heart attack. Uh, we're at the funeral, and I got to tell you, it was very humid. Well, that cemetery, that's Jersey City Cemetery, it's kind of... It's kind of like a pit. It's like oh. sunk in, oh. in, the, in the rest of the town. It was the hot. You could, town. It's, you could see Tony Soprano's collar. Yeah, it's, it's all hot. wet. It was humid, sweaty, disgusting. Yeah. Very hot it's day. Hot. And the sun, uh, there's no. There's not a lot of shade in there. The sun just beats right oh, down. Oh, it's just it. awful. Uh, yeah, Tony says, Uncle Junior, I thought I'm going to go see my father. Thought you'd like to pay your respects to your brother. Wow, by crying to a chunk of marble? All right. Five hours, they let me out for these funerals. I got to spend it being maudlin. It's a beautiful day. He's on some kind of mood elevators, and he's... Uptake he's in, in inhibitors. inhibitors. Yeah, he's, uh, he's uh, I'll pay my respects from the after party. After party, and he goes, after party, which it's called a repast. A repast. It's repast. not a party. It's not a party. It's a repast. But Junior's in his own little... He's, uh, he's in his own world here. He's True. enjoying these... You know, they're like uh, little field trips to him. Yeah, and he's... he gets out of the house. He can't stand to be in the house anymore. Uh, it's a big thing with Italians. Uh, the the eating before, the after, the in between the funerals, very important yeah. to these Italians. I don't quite get it because I hate the funerals and I'm very against all of that. But what you're against the uh, the funeral, past? the ceremony, the way against funerals. Yeah, I don't like funerals. I don't want to go to them, and I don't want to have one, as we've discussed okay. we a know, lot of times. We know what you want, but I'm saying you're against funerals. I, I, I'm against funerals. I don't like funerals. you got to say, hey, I think respect, it's, say it's, goodbye. It's barbaric for what? people to have to go to a funeral and see someone oh, dead take in a, the take box. Take away the seeing part. Now, having a funeral. Have a, have a memorial. A memorial. Have a celebration of life. Okay, there you go. I'm okay with I'm that. I'm down with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like the body. Let's body have a Michael Imperioli. He was a great guy. He did this. He did that. He was wonderful. Let's bring him in. Let's talk about him. Suddenly, I'm wonderful. Let's have I'm, a drink. I'm no I was just paraphrasing. Uh, I was paraphrasing. Know, now, I'm wonderful because I'm did. dead. I'm wonderful. <laughs>
like everyone else. Like Don't they? Else. Every fucking person that I hear about, they lit up a room. When you met him, he lit up a room. Every room he walked in, he lit him up. Really? Right. When he was dead, you didn't give two fucks about him. When he was alive. Not alive, yeah. Uh, you know, there's now, now uh, Johnny, he goes to Johnny's grave, and there's a woman there. It's Fran Felstein. Now, do you think she knew that racetrack was going to be sold? She heard somebody died, and she's there to s set up Tony to get the money? I don't know. Because there's theories I, I saw online. There's theories about that. Well, I, I, it, I'm not saying it's this theory. I'm not saying it's impossible. She's a hustler. She's a gold digger. Uh, I do believe she went there figuring maybe take a shot. Looking at the old bits like Junior does. Seeing just, somebody yeah, in the she family saw died. that he died. Yeah. Uh, let me take a shot. I'll go over and visit. And let's maybe his son will show up. I think that. Maybe. I don't know if she went as deep. As, as as that as deep as maybe no, knowing the track could she be certainly knew the track was going to be sold but no? that's really a i mean look it's possible there's another theory that she was a ghost that none okay of that stop that you <laughs> now you're gonna fucking break my <laughs> I'm ball. kidding it's not I, my theory i went with you on one and now you're gonna break my ball it's not my theory well what I'm schmuck just... said that you know, there's all kinds of people well, that have fucking, all well, kinds of analysis. Because there's people stuff. that are full of shit, and they're just making it up so we could talk about it. I don't know it. if they're making it up. That's their opinion. Are Steve. you that naive? They get you on the hook? I'm not naive, but I'm, I am like to, you know, listen, at least it's a show where people think into it. It's not all just like cut and dry. Well, we know that. We talk about that. That's but, why we're doing this, this show. But this is also common sense. This is not stupidity. Some writers and critics make up that shit yeah they do they want to right. show how pseudo intelligent they are you're right you know they do you so know? there she he gets to the grave there's fran felstein uh and he wonders what this woman's doing. not italian now. is she italian well it could be a married name she's married her son uh you know lives in tel aviv so she might she probably married a uh a jewish we we don't know it's not really uh defined there He's kind of curious what he's doing at she's doing at the grave of not just her father, but it's his mother's grave too. Yeah, uh, you're the lady from Bamberger's. That yeah. used to be a big department store. Bamberger's right? was uh, in Newark, uh, founded in 1892, and in 1912 they took up a whole city block in Newark. Louis Bamberger was a philanthropist. He actually helped the Jews escape Nazi Germany. There's a USS Louis Bamberger was a World II, World War II ship they named after him. Uh, he sold it in 1928. No, he sold it uh, in 1929 to Macy's. They let him keep the name till 1986. But in 1928, that store made $28 million, which wow. is the equivalent of like $400 million today. It was the fourth gro largest grossing store in the U.S. Bamberger's clock in Newark was for many, many, many years like the meeting place. I'll meet you at Bamberger's clock. Gotcha. It was like in Grand Central, you know, the clock in uh, uh, you're Anthony. I was a friend of your father's. You're the lady from Bamberg. It's a fur department. So he, he must have heard Inkling's whiffs of this growing up. He heard. And she was kind of, like we're talking about, mythologizing this woman. Worked in the fur department, high class. Sure. You, know, you could tell she was, uh, she's still nice looking, but when she was younger, you could tell she was probably, she was a, we see pictures, she was a real yeah. good looking woman. Uh, uh, she gets right to him. It hits him right bullseye. Johnny was very proud of you. You were very special to him. You know, Johnny told me if I ever need anything, I should always call his son. Now, that's the first line of the hustle. Right yeah, there. of course. But the first line was he's proud of you. He wants to hear that. He sure, worshipped his right. father. He worshipped he, his father. father could do no wrong. His father was a murderer, a bad guy, not a good dad. He lied. Well, we see later on in this episode, he lied to his mother. To protect his and father. And he put, he put the brunt on Livia always. Always. At least she didn't suffer. He said she made us all suffer, suffer instead. You were very special to Johnny. If I ever need anything, I should call his son. What a bullshit line that is. And then he says, what do you need? And he bites. He bites. It's a really nice scene, by the way. Yeah. Well written, well directed, well acted. I mean, but he bites. Vesuvio's. Jim's, Jim's excellent in that scene. So is Funeral repairs. Tony sits with Junior. I was in love with that woman. She was the reason I never got married. I wanted to propose. I had the ring all picked out. 
Uh, how could I be in this life we live on a woman? Junior was in love. She was the reason he never married. He talked about the going to the... How can he bring a woman into this life? They all do. Everybody does, yeah. Well, and then he brings up the uh, 500 Club. It was on Missouri Avenue, Atlantic City, where the Trump Plaza parking garage is now. They had a back room. They, they had a show played room. there. Back room was a, the first illegal casino in AC. It was from the 30s to the 70s. It burned down in the 70s. Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Lewis Martin, Lewis and Martin, Eartha Kitt, Liberace, Milton Berle performed there. Your friend. There you go. Uh, Liberace. Opened, Liberace. Liberace was my friend. Hi, Lee. Not Milton. Hi, yeah. Steve. And it uh, was also uh, one of the few clubs in the area that was open to both black and white patrons when it opened in the 30s. They opened at 5 p.m. and they were open till 10 in the morning. The last show was at 4 in the morning. Wow. Uh, what was your favorite uh, Jerry Lewis movie? Well, a nutty, nutty Professor, of course. Really? Yeah. I like that, but I like the bellboy. The bellboy? Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. I like too. that. I and like he that. talks about Enzo Stuarti, who was a, an Italian tenor. My grandmother player. liked him. So did my grandfather yeah. and grandmother. His, he, for a while, when he came to America, he called himself Larry Lawrence or Larry Stewart. He left uh, Italy when Mussolini came to power and lived in Newark. Uh, he say, so Tony says she's got great legs for an old broad. And Junior, you know, uh, Junior wants to sing. Which is very He asked the waiter, did you bring your guitar? He said, not to this. Uh, come on, uh, sing. And he starts singing Volare. No one else wants to sing. They're all in mourning. They're all very sad here. And Uncle Zio's at the table. Yeah. The guy's wife died. Well, Junior's really out of... You know, he's kind of out of his gourd here. <laughs> he talks about Johnny, Johnny Boy Soprano... Walked into the 500 Club in his side divorce suit with the two-inch lapels. Side divorce was the guy who dressed the Rat Pack. Sinatra, Peter Lawford. Uh, Said he never had a chance after that. Sinatra's lapels were actually two and a quarter inch in the 60s, and that's that's what he's referring to. Side divorce was, I think, out of Beverly Hills or was his shop or his store. Uh, the AA meeting, Christopher's at the meeting. JT is there. About 15 years ago, I moved from Jersey to Hollywood, broke into the biz. It was a dream come true. Drugs, alcohol, that shit practically comes with the writer's guild card. Is this the, did we see Tim Daly yet on the show? I don't remember. Is this the first time? I think episode? this is the first time Tim we Tim Daly him. was in the movie Diner with Mickey Rourke. Oh, Warren yeah, and great Bacon. stuff. He also, Wings, 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 Wings which, was not a, which was not a Tony Sirico show. Yeah, exactly. But um, but he's on a show now. He's on a show with Tia Leon. He he's on well, a show. It just ended. One or the other. He was in. Uh, David Chase had a series that he created with Larry Connor, who wrote on the Sopranos, but also wrote many Saints of Newark. David called Almost Grown, which was about a couple, three time periods in their life. Like I guess when they were courting, when they newlyweds, and when they're older. The, it lasted, I think, one season. It was really cr critically acclaimed, 1988. But, too uh, smart for TV. Too smart for TV. He did a play at Studio Dante with us that Nick Sandow directed. Uh, too smart for TV. Henry Flamethrower. And you know, well. when he's there, uh, you know, I'm a TV writer, which by default makes me a douchebag. I mean, this is a tongue-in-cheek, obviously. Terry Winter's writing this about TV writers. He knocks TV numerous times in the episode when later on we see him uh, trying to cash in his Emmy. He goes, his Emmy, yeah. maybe if it was Corner. an Oscar. Uh, he's, but you know what, uh, JT, it's like he's bragging. He's showing off. Sure, I he's blew giving a deadline his credits. on Nash Bridges. Nash, uh, he's giving his know. credits. Uh, it's like he's performing. Uh, you know, I, I want to talk about taking a moral... Uh, about uh, moral, moral inventory Curry. is the fourth step of Alcoholics Anonymous, where you basically list your, you know, your shortcomings, your strengths as well. But you know, and now and, can you uh, go to AA and not talk to some? Say I go to AA, I don't want to talk to nobody. Yeah, I could sit there for two years and not say a word. Yeah, some meetings though are closed meetings, which means the only people allowed there are people who have a desire to stop drinking. Some are open to anybody. You do not have to say or do anything when you're there. So you don't have to get up and give the whole speech. Well, what happens at a meeting is one person usually has been asked beforehand to qualify, which is what he's doing. You give 
some people call it a drunkalogue. So you might talk for 15, 20 minutes about your history, what it was like when you were drinking, when you hit bottom, when you got help, what it's like now being sober. Then they open it up and people share for a couple of minutes, two, three, four minutes about what they just heard or about what they're going through. That's an A meeting. You're not required to share. Usually when someone gives a, the, you know, the, the qualification, like what he's doing, they have a certain amount of sobriety by, by now. What happens if, what happens if a guy starts talking shit up there? Uh, do they people start well, saying sit rude. down or uh, shut up? What do you mean by Bullshit. talking shit? I'd uh, say he starts giving his political views or his uh, whatever view. Well, say uh, he hates certain kind of, you know, you know what I'm saying? Well, the re you're supposed to keep it to, you know, you're not supposed to be. Maybe he goes off topic. I don't know. I'm, I've never seen that happen. I mean, what you're not allowed to do is. So you give you give your qualification. You talk for twenty minutes. You're not. I'm not now. One I want to share. I'm not allowed to say, Steve. You know when you brought up the fact when you were puking None in the that. gutter. You know you. I can't. Cro that's called crosstalk. Okay. So You're there's rules in there. That. Yeah, this is there's rules. You know. Uh, uh, I mean, AA has no uh, opinion on any p political or any uh, outside opinion. Their only purpose is for pe to help people stay sober. They don't. They're not affiliated with any organizations. They they prom, they don't promote or or they're against any causes or political things like that. Uh, he, then he says he uh, you know long before you know after the the drugs the alcohol anyway long before he discovers heroin things start to fall apart. He got fired. Uh, he didn't work for 18 months, a year and a half with no work. Grace of God, he got himself into rehab in Pennsylvania, and that's where he ran into Christopher. Right. So he gives Christopher a shout out. And I think it's a, you know, Christopher likes, you know, I mean, uh, I think obviously he, the guy is a successful Hollywood screenwriter, and that appeals to Christopher, no doubt. He, we, well, for your office, Tony, he got, uh, he got from this woman what he couldn't get at home support, you know, love. Does that justify his infidelity? He says she, she meaning Livia, drove him into that woman's arms. Yeah. Like it's all about. It's all, his father walks on water. But it also justifies Tony's own infidelity as well, right? Oh, sure, I guess. Yeah, yeah of course he's got, you know, uh, what was it like sitting there with Fran? Are you attracted to her? Come on, she's old enough to be my mother. Oh, Jesus Christ, it's an expression. Don't cream yourself. I did not want to fuck my mother. You should have seen her with the hair net and the house dress. Tony is disgusted just thinking yeah, about her. I know. Uh, I have a friend of mine has a gomada. For 45 years. Very strange, huh? 45 years. Still? Three kids. It's still going on? Did he have kids with her? No. No, he had three ki uh, kids with his wife. They were both married. He's got kids. Obviously. Did the wife know? Not, not. Not official. Front. They never, he didn't get the green light, if that's what you mean. But. For 45 years, wow. I guess some people's rationalization, I'm not going to judge here, believe it or not, right or wrong, they say, uh, my wife doesn't give me what I want, doesn't like to do the same things. And I don't mean sexually, I mean overall. She doesn't like to travel, she doesn't like to do this, doesn't want to do that. Uh, and this woman does, but I don't want to leave her. I don't want to leave my kids. I don't want to break up my break family, up family, my yeah. grandkids. I don't want to do that. So they have a girlfriend. Some wives say, go ahead, take it, yeah. go. And I'm going to give a little tip for you out there now. A little Steve Schreiber tip for those of you that have a gumada and you uh, going away on vacation with your family. And if you don't want to get caught, take the gumada with you. Have the family on the 20th floor and have her like oh, on right. the 15th this floor. sounds like, uh, you know, Three's Company episode. I'm right? telling you something here. You're with your family. The kids are by the pool. You're with your wife. I'm going to go out for a walk. Boom. Elevator. You go down to the 15th floor. 
spend a few hours with the Gemara. Yeah, that sounds real relaxing. Like you're going to be hey, running up and down the elevator. Listen oh, to me. Oh, I forgot to bring up the sandwiches. Long, I'll be right back. As long as the Gemara <laughs> don't give you up, you will not get caught. That sounds horrendous. She comes in on a different plane. <sighs> I'm telling you something. Steve, you want to take it from me? I just try to get through the day, Steve. You know what I mean? I you understand. Mean, I don't do I it. Even just thinking about that. I don't do it. Tired. I never did it, but I know people who have done it. it sounds this horrible. is the way not to get caught. It sounds horrible. Well, listen, you're judging. Yeah, I am judging. Maybe the guy's wife. I'm 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 just imagining myself doing it. Okay. All right. What they about if whatever this, they want. What about really if this guy's shit. wife is the worst person in the world and he doesn't want to leave his kids? And the reason he doesn't want to leave his kids, he doesn't want her to she'll be vindictive and move some horrible guy in to their house. The house that he pays for. Right. The the, the yeah, child support that he's he the most horrible person in the world, you gotta get away from her. Now you're going to leave your kids. You don't want to leave the kids. So what do you do? You have a good wife <sighs> and a good mother. I have a good wife and a good mother. Not everyone does. Yeah, yeah I'm lucky. It's something We're to lucky, think about. Steve. It's something to think about. They should have an ex-wife anonymous. Guys go in there and figure out what to do. Well, you're not addicted to your wife. Some people are. Don't, don't be fooled, my naive friend. I don't, know. don't be fooled. Uh, the IHOP restaurant. Christmas Hasbrook Heights. That's where that is. What's that? Hasbrook Heights. The uh, JT, uh, he's a showbiz douchebag. He, he is. He, he's up for uh, Dick Wolf for Law and Order. He And Chris says, I saw Dick Wolf at Rails. He, he's got his own limo. Oh, that, limo. That impresses him. Right now, he got his own fucking plane. I'm Are sure you kidding me? This is. Plane. This is uh, 17 years ago. Yeah. Dick Wolf is... Uh, he might have had a plane back then. Who knows? May possibly be the most successful guy ever. In I mean, he's got five television? shows on the oh, air yeah. now. He could have more. his own network just rerunning Absolutely. all those shows. The Dick Wolf Network. Yeah. Uh, he confesses, Christopher confesses that he had some wine. His girlfriend had an accident. So he's lying. Chris is lying. Well, he, he did have wine. He, he drank vodka. He had uh, he drank vodka and he did drugs and he went probably. crazy yeah. and he drank vodka. He makes it. He really, you know, yeah. cleans it up here. I had a little wine. It's like he had a little glass of red wine with some macaroni. That's, no, not, what that's not what happened. Chris, I've been sober and I've been high. Sober is better. JT's in a hurry. He's got to meet a girl. He says. Yeah, he's a rush. He's in a rush to get out of there. But no slip. You call me anytime. Right. Christopher uses Adriana's car crash as an excuse. Yeah. Uh, Junior's house. Junior looks for the obituaries, calls Melvoin. That's like what Livy used to do. Right? Richard Portnow plays Melvoin. There's a funeral I need to attend. I want to call the feds. Vincent Patronella. <laughs> my, my niece's godfather. I think I met him at a barbecue for the Bicentennial, which was 28 years 1976. before. 1976. 28 years. And uh, he says, all they could say is no. Uh, Melvoin is great. He plays this great. Yeah. <laughs> Melvoin played by Richard Portnow. Uh, Fran's house. Tony brings Fran flowers. Sees a picture of Fran's son with the dog, Tippy. Freckles. Bruce. Uh, they renamed him Freckles, the dog. And, and he really... Tony does not like that. He feels really betrayed. She also says, your father used to bring me flowers and lingerie. You know, she's really working. Him. I would have, I, I think I would have rather pers on a personal level, if the dog was gassed, gassed and gave and it gave to his, away. gave it to his girlfriend. His, his gumar. That's kind of uh, cold hearted. So it's and, cold hearted. And changed the name. And he feels really, really, really betrayed. And then says, my mother made him give the dog away. Yeah. Blaming Livia again. Not blaming this woman who took whatever, you know, who he was cheating on. She still has Johnny Boy slippers, which I find very weird. Yes, yes. That's maybe bullshit. How does he know if it's his slippers? That's somebody's slippers. So, uh, so Bruce uh, had him for 10 years until he moved to Tel Aviv. He's a manager at El Al. Oh, all the airlines. Another, another little tidbit that doesn't need to be there. Yeah. Could be, you know. Great details. You know. Uh, she said that uh, she's showing pictures that uh, Johnny Boy reminded him of Victor Mature. There's a picture of them at the Latin Quarter with Hesh, Hesh's girlfriend. Now, Latin Quarter 
was owned by Lou Walters, who's Barbara Walters' father. He opened the original Latin Quarter in 1942 on Broadway in 47. Sinatra played there, Ella Fitzgerald. Milton Burrow, he played there. I saw a picture uh, of my father. I told you uh, my father had a grandma I had two kids. Right. And one of them put up a picture of my father with his gomada like at the Copa. They were all dressed up. It was weird, man. From like way back, the 70s. Yeah. Huh? Oh, no. 60s. Oh. So how many years did he have? 60s, the, the, sure. The, 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 the 60s. Many years. And would he go back and forth? Yeah. Remember what? And did, he would be gone for a while? Yeah, sometimes years. Wow. But, and they just lived, I think, over in Coney Island. So like 10 minutes away. Uh, yeah, you know, 15 minutes, whatever. Yeah. But I saw that picture. That was weird because that wasn't just, you know, about it. Now you saw them. They were out yeah. like a couple. Yeah. You know, black and white picture, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Similar to the one they show in the Kind of. Right here. Black and white picture. They look very nice. She says, Hesh was a whore master and cheap, and he screwed me out of my retirement money against your dad's wishes. Really just. She uh, lays it out now. And Jeez. and we're not really sure how much of this is true, really. Now, well, Johnny said to Hesh, take care of her, which he didn't say specifically. Maybe. No, but don't you think Hesh would have, uh, Hesh had to give come up with a lot of money. You know, Phil only had to come up with 40%. Hesh had to come up with the bulk of it. Don't you right. think he would have, you know, fucking said, wait a minute here, hold on. This is bullshit. It really, you know. He would have squawked a little uh, harder, I think. Yeah. He didn't do that. So that tells me Hesh was guilty. And it also goes to show you friend, no friend. They could grab the money. They grab the money. All right. When somebody dies. Oh, sure. Right? If nothing else, it should have went to Tony. And not at all. He never brought it up to Tony. He was going to keep that. When someone dies, they, it seems like nobody takes care of anybody. No. Yeah. She said the one with the hair. From New Phil York, Leotardo. Phil Leotardo. Don't get me started. Now that was he says. Oh yeah, the midget auto racing uh, Chickamauga Raceway in New Egypt. Uh, there's actually a speedway in New Egypt, uh, but we filmed the track in Long Island at Riverhead. That's where it was filmed. Is that where it was uh, filmed? Uh, Bruce sends her money occasionally. She's got a sob story. She's working it, boy. She's working it. She's, She's laying pro. it on thick. I guess Phil Leotardo got it. In. Johnny gave cut him in uh, with the track after a poker debt. And John, and she says, Johnny said his piece would go to me after she's dead, which I don't know if I believe that. Hesh well, I don't know if I believe, but Hesh didn't uh, argue enough. No, would have said, right. wait a minute. She was just a uh, pass around. You know, she, she really wasn't he his girl. He didn't give it to Livia. No, he didn't give it to anyone. <laughs> no. Hesh wasn't giving it. Hesh is a slick. He's a slick. money guy. He's a very smart guy. Sure. He's probably got more money than all of them. Uh, Tony's car, Tony and Fran drive. So I saw my Uncle June, said hello. I don't know if you noticed, but he was a little hot for you. He was practically a stalker. He said he suffered Junior in was silence. Not, not good with women, was he? He I, used I to know. skulk outside skulk. my building. All I was weird phone calls. Weird phone I calls. I always had a hunch he told Livia about me and Johnny. Which may have happened, right? And she pulls out a flask. She pulls out a flask. That's real low rent, man. And Tony, at first, is questioning, you know, like he's kind of, Tony's going along with the ride. He's getting a kick out of her. He takes a sip of booze, but this... Middle of the afternoon. Quick. Yeah, it's because she's carrying a flask around. Come and on. he can go. You could see he's like sussing it out. He can go either way. Either it's kind of pathetic, or she's kind of like a. You know. Have you ever carried a flask around? Maybe on occasion, not really? like as a rate. Maybe if I was going somewhere when I was into big into booze. I think years ago, maybe only going to a football game, you know, or something like that in the winter and the cold, maybe, but. Walking around with a flask isn't really my thing. No. Though I did uh, fill up a water bottle. With vodka. When we were in Australia, they gave such small, remember? They gave and a I tiny told you, shot. A tiny booze. shot. I mean, you literally couldn't fill my cavity, for real. And I told you that because I got there before you. I said, I'm telling you. And then when you ordered something, it was tiny, remember? Like ridiculous. Tiny, tiny, tiny. And so Vinnie Pastor hit a jackpot and took us out to dinner. 
And I had a jackpot in the casino. In the casino, won like nine hundred dollars. But he was taking us out anyway. That was a nice meal. Great restaurant. That was in Gold Coast, Australia. Seafood that, that restaurant, night, famous yeah. seafood restaurant. And I filled up a water bottle, a tw- like a water bottle, with vodka that I had back in the room, and <laughs> I didn't give a shit that Vinny, because Vinny said, "What are you doing? I'm paying. You don't have to do that." I said, "It's not about the fucking money. I can afford it." And and, and then some. You got to keep ordering it all night. I mean, what are you going to keep screwing me over? Give me a goddamn drink. So I ordered one drink and I, on the rocks, and then I just kept ordering more ice, glass ice, and I just filled it up. Well, when we went out our last night uh, in Melbourne, uh, we went to that restaurant in the casino yeah. there. And you had your own bottle. I had my own bottle of vodka. <laughs> give me a goddamn drink. You had your yeah, own but you're bottle. giving me little. Kettle one. I mean, they're like drop droplets of vodka. Yeah. Let me get a fucking swig of that. I'm not driving. Yeah. You know? God damn it. So that's why the, you Australians, I love you to death. When you come here, that's why you go crazy. They give you a real, real drink real here. drink. In New uh, York City. I don't blame she you. She says something to Tony, and you could see Jim. Jim plays it really well. She says, handsome woman, your mother. Not sexy, statuesque, and he's... You know, he can talk bad about his mother, but, yeah. you know, when oh, yeah. she starts, it doesn't go down as That's well. It. I could know. say it, but you can't. You know, no woman wants to be called handsome. No. You know, maybe Bruce Jenner. He well, you don't lie. mind being called pretty, do you? I've never been called pretty, ever. <laughs> no one's ever called me pretty. Uh, we, uh, what is this, the Chickamauga? Chickamauga Raceway, that shot at Riverhead Raceway in Riverhead, Long Island. It's quarter-mile oval asphalt track. Star- they still race stock cars there. It opened in 1951. What about your 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 women, your wife, what's she like? Uh, how about your girlfriend? So she's assuming that he has a gumata. Just assume. She's that, assuming. You know. She also, you know, she's working, you know, she's kind of, Instigating. If I know Hesh, him and Phil got something going on out here because she, you know, he she knows that's going to push his buttons. Right? Uh, she's an odd deal, a very sophisticated Valentina. She's not very sophisticated. She's sophisticated. No. We see her for a second. I guess in his, she's Latin from Spain. Um, <laughs> is she from Spain? I don't even know. Ah, well, she's from Spain. I don't. I don't think so. Maybe JT and Christopher work out at the gym. That we shot that out in Long Island. I guess it was, was there real weights. Yeah, we shot at the World Gym in Ronkonkoma. But they weren't fake weights. No, those were real weights. Oh yeah, they were very heavy. Because you could hear them clanging. Sure, you're clanging. Come on. You could see Chris is not going to make this a habit though. <laughs> He's doing it to try to be sober and go with the guy, but it's not going to. Trying. Uh, what? Well, there's nothing the you want to talk like about? This, I, the fingerless gloves. I, I was <laughs> on it. I hate. The, one of the things I hate most in life is lifting weights. I did when I was younger. Hate it. Yeah. Hate it. Yeah. I was honest with you the other night. What do you tell me? You're not using. You ran out of IHOP like you were on fire. Uh, I was meeting a girl. We were going to the track, the Meadowlands. I don't want to miss the last race. I am totally clean and sober. And here it is. I could save you a trip. Take your action. He wants a dime, a thousand dollars each on the Yankees and, and St. Louis. Louis right? That's a big number, a thousand dollars. He just got a residual check for that's life. Now, did you ever see that? Yeah, uh, it was with uh, Kevin Dillon, Ellen Bernstein. Paul Savino. I think Debbie Mazar was on it as well. Debbie Mazar? Uh, you know, Frank Renzulli was an EP, and Jack Bender directed one of the episodes. And Paul Savino just turned 82 recently. Really? Uh, it was set in Belfield, New Jersey, which is fictional, but it's a combination of Belleville and Bloomfield. Belfield. Right. I never saw that show. I didn't know that one. Well, it was okay. It was a drama, right? Yeah, it didn't last very long. It was about Italian family. It didn't last. Uh, it wasn't a wise guy show. It was a mob no, show. No, 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 no. Like working class family kind yeah, of thing? Family yeah, drama? Yeah. Oh, I never saw it. Uh, it might have had some comedy in there. Back to the racetrack, to Tony and friend, uh, walk along the stands. You know, you, you, you're very, I don't know, you got a lot of class because she pulls out a hanky. A linen hanky. He says, is that silk? I mean, he's so big deal. It's a lot of it's him kind of. Relating to his father. Fantasy. The hero worship through this woman. You know what I mean? Now they see a sign. Sold by owner. Last race Sunday. 
Right. Hesh's house. Tony meets with Hesh. He told me uh, not to look at. He told me to look after her. So I sent her some money, which is a hell of a lot more than anybody else did. Right. Plus, Hesh resents the fact that he had to do all the work. Phil was in the can. He had to pay the rent, pay the taxes, and keep the upkeep. And Tony's like, well, what about my share? I never, all those years, I never saw a dime. You want it, you got it. It's 25%. The closing's not for two weeks. Appreciate it. If you call Phil Leotardo and tell him he should assume part of that burden. And 25% is about 150 grand, right? So you're talking about you want it, you got it. He was going to keep this 150 grand that his... That Tony deserved, right? She, he, he, uh, he says, I should give it to some trollop. What is that? What's a trollop? A whore. Is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, they were gonna, they were gonna fuck Tony and Fran. Uh, you, you only call at two a.m. when you need something. Uh, and then Hesh says, he says maybe because she won't, you know, fuck around with you. And he goes, she's a little pale for my taste. For my taste. He says my father loved her, and said. And Hesh says, she was not a bad person, but something always rubbed me the wrong way about her. And you could kind of see why. Well, uh, you know, uh, Melvoin's on the phone with the feds. Junior is there. Uh, I've been aware that it's been two funerals in a month. He's talking to the counselor. For God's sakes, the man wants to pay his respects. Well, perhaps my next call should be <laughs> Judge Runyon's. Get him involved. So he's he's talking to the DA, right? And getting him Counselor. out to go to these five-hour field trips to funerals. And Junior's Junior loves really happy. You're Love worth him. every fucking sense. Right. It's a cousin's sister through marriage. Right. Sister of Junior's cousin. And we see Bacala helping him get dressed, put the armband on. Uh, I've never worn an armband at a funeral. Have you? No. No. Junior seems to be enjoying it. He likes getting dressed up. He's, you know, he's really gets, in his he gets own. Gets to go out. He's alone. Uh, they, you know, Bobby's not around as much as he was since he's married to Janice. Uh, he's got the kids. He, uh, uh, Bobby says they're going to have Scottish bagpipes at the funeral. Should be interesting. Ba bagpipes make me sad. Do they? Yeah, because in nine eleven, you know, I had three of my close friends die, and they had bagpipes at. Yeah. These tremendous funerals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were they just, were they police or firefighters? Yeah, yeah it just yeah. makes me sad. They were yeah. firemen. That's terrible. And just the sound of that makes me sad. Yeah. Uh, bada bing, JT meets Christopher. Christopher gives JT a stack of cash. The Yankees won. And you know, I don't. I've never bet on baseball, and I'm not even sure how that works. Baseball it, is the one sport right. that you have a shot to win. You know, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying that you can't win uh, playing basketball and all that. But uh, it's a money line with baseball. So, like, how? So, so say you, Yankees are favored by what? Runs? By two runs? Three no. runs? Is that how it works or no? How does it work? No. It's, it's a money see, line. It's a money line. So, you bet 100 bucks. If the Yankees win, you get paid. What, you, whatever you it is. 90. Or 80 or whatever it is. But the thing about in Vegas, there was a movie that I did, but. They have these runners, and there's a lot of outs. So if you had guys going to different sports books, you might catch it at 80, 90. You know, you know what I mean? You catch the, the money line. Before the game starts. Yeah. You it may changes. catch it. It changes. If you have enough outs out there, there's different sports books, so it's changing. Different you know, odds. Different, different odds. Books. A couple of bookmakers, one back east, one here. So guys that are really playing. Now, don't get me wrong. They might be betting – 200 grand to win 50, but day after day after day you after win 50, day, you win 50. if you got a big enough bankroll, you can make a lot of money. A lot of guys but make it's money just, with But it's baseball. not by the runs. It's just by no. the money line. Yeah. So of, exactly. you bet Yankees, if they win, you get paid. But the baseball is the one way if you have a, a lot of big bankroll and a lot of outs to bet. What do you mean outs? A lot of different places you could bet your money. <laughs> okay. Different odds, different places. Oh, I got you. Okay, you know, you're going here, I'm going there. I got a bookmaker here, I got a there. You could do it. Uh, better odds than, you know, playing basketball with the points or football right. or whatever. You know, right. that's 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 all I'm saying. Now, all the people that are genius gamblers will give me tips. No, yes, no, no. Of course. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Hey, you spent a lot of time in casinos okay. in Vegas. Uh, books. 
Christopher, uh, you, you want a real game. Uh, he says he went out to an Indian casino and played some poker. You want a real game, I'll hook you up. High stakes. David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth. JT's getting into gambling like he getting it like he gets into drugs. And he, met, he meets at the bar of Bing. Kind of a weird choice. Bad idea. Meeting at a bar. Obviously, you know, if you have an addictive personality, gambling can be, and you've said it probably on this show before, maybe one of the worst addictions there is. Gambling. I feel the worst addiction. Uh, Chris confesses he smoked weed with a super who came over to caulk the toilet. <laughs> Another said, specific. And, and JT says, we're not normal. We're addicts. We can't just have a smoke weed because it could lead to you shooting up next. See, time. JT's the smartest. He calls you uh, Chris Don Provolone. Yeah. That's a fucking derogatory. Like when people say, gabagool, gabagool, gabagool. Right. You eat gabagool. That's like saying to someone, you eat watermelon. You eat fucking bagels and locks. You know, it's an ethnic stereotype. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, it is. Don't fuck around with me with this gabagool shit because you're making fun. You're mocking, you know? Yeah. And I don't I'm a I'm, vegetarian. Yeah. So what do they say? Gagoots, gagoots. <laughs> hey, eat the gagoots. Eat the motadel and the provolone and the da 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 Right? To those people, we say <laughs> <laughs> Averna Social Club. Mulberry Street, I love that bar, actually. It's a nice, uh, it's still a Old bar. school, good Old bar. School. Still there. Mulberry it's Street It's called Maricato, bar. no? I don't know. Isn't Did that what it's called? Name? It yeah. was called that for a while. So you got Tony, Silvio, Phil, Hesh, Johnny Sack. They're getting $625,000 for the track and the land. And Phil doesn't like it. That's all? Yeah, that's all. It's 25%. 150000 is going to Tony Soprano, who's going to give it to Fran Felstein. So 40, you know, that, this... this uh, yeah, it's real money. Yeah. Uh, Phil, you got some balls, kid. I'll give you that much. Tony snaps. You give me what I fucking tell you to give me. This ain't the 70s and I'm not a kid. He ain't... Tony's had it with Phil. He's, had he's it. not fucking around. This guy treats him like he's not a boss. And later on, he... He says it. He's yeah. a boss, Phil. You know, Johnny, Johnny says, says it. And he says, oh, what, Jersey? Like, you know. He doesn't respect him, basically. And he says, you got, what does he say? Five days, four days to give me my money? Yeah. And that's it. Frank's pl uh, Fran's place? He's got money for Fran. Uh, in advance on what she's going to get paid. She shows him JFK's. This is all bullshit. You know. I looked up some auction items for JFK memorabilia. Now, there's a his bomber jacket, How which much? he wore when he was, I guess, in the five hundred thousand. Exactly. How'd you know that? I just assumed. Exactly. It was right Look at that. Yeah. Five hundred thousand. The f a flag that flew at the White House in the Kennedy administration. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Yes, you're on a roll. Two hundred thousand. Tw Twenty-one thousand. Oh. His rocking chair, fifty grand. Pens that he signed the Peace Corps, you know, thing, uh -huh. the Nuclear Treaty, 60000 Didn't uh, Didn't Peterman on Seinfeld have his golf the clubs? Golf clubs, yeah. And the wedding cake. No, the wedding cake was, <laughs> well, no, the cake was somebody else. Was uh, uh, FDR's hanky go, went for 1400 which seems like a bargain. Yeah. But I think JFK might get more money than FDR. And the captain's hat. Which Tony has? How much? $7,500. Oh, so that's very doable. I believe he owned that then. That's doable. That makes sense. Somebody looked that up. They didn't. If it was worth 500000 Tony wouldn't that's be owning good. it, right? He would not own it. Now, he says we had a little thing. We had something special, crazy passion. She tells this big bullshit story. You think it's a bullshit story? Yeah. And then he went with the Sable, and Sinatra was there, and Peter Lawford. And wow, but you don't, so you don't think she slept with Kennedy? No. Well, listen, we know Kennedy had a lot of affairs. I understand. Some of the women he had affairs with, he had Marilyn, which apparently he had sex with at Bing Crosby's house. Mimi Alford was a 19-year-old intern at the White House that he had an affair with. Blaze Starr was a famous stripper. Yeah. Marlena Dietrich. Good movie, Blaze, uh... Paul Newman. But listen to this. Marlena Dietrich slept with JFK when she was 60 and he was like 42. Uh, she also slept with his father. Yeah, yeah. Well, the father bought that big house for her, supposedly, you know? 
Angie think, Dickinson. In Inglewood, New Angie, Jersey. Angie Dickinson. That's a good one. Judy Campbell. She's going to be 90. Who they mentioned. Now, Judy Campbell had an abortion. She was also Sam Giancana's mistress and kind of was the conduit between the uh, Chicago mob and Kennedy, apparently. But it seems like a true story because she mentions Lem Billings was a family friend of the Kennedys. Listen, I guess it's uh, possible. I just think this is all a ruse to, to impress Tony. That's what I'm thinking. You could be right. Uh, do you know that I did a special? It was a three-part series. Right. One of them was about Sammy the Bull. One of them was uh, mob-related, like the Donnie Brasco story. And the other one was Marilyn and the Mob. Marilyn Monroe with JFK. And Jakarta. Discovery Channel uh, would not air the one... About JFK. Because one of the fucking bosses... Uh, one of the guys, not David Zaslav, who I love, but another boss who's there, a prick, was friends with the Kennedys and would not allow us to air it. Wow. And he squashed it, saying that, and everyone knows that JFK slept with Marilyn, as did Bobby. Bobby. And, uh, I mean, certainly, listen, I wasn't there, but seems to be common knowledge. And they wouldn't allow us to uh, air it. And it cost a lot of money. I mean, we shot, you know, it was an hour wow, that's documentary. It's called Mob Scene. It's really Your good. Show. That was the show I was talking about. Maybe it's out now. Maybe you could, you know, but it, uh, there was three episodes, Mob Scene, three mob shows, and they pulled the plug on one. Wow. You know? Well, there's a quote attributed to JFK. If I don't have sex every day, I get a headache. JFK apparently said that. Really? Yeah. Well, he had, uh, Jackie was nice. Jackie, he was nice, uh, you but know, he was a, you know, he was a philanderer. Jackie, uh, Jackie, oh, you know, uh, my friend Pete Hamill, who just passed away, he, he dated her for quite he a dated while. Jackie, Jackie, oh, and he lived know. with Shirley MacLaine for seven or eight years. She lived in Park Slope, Brooklyn. JFK was forty-four when he became president. He was a young guy, you know. He was forty-six when he died. So, you know, he was, he was, and uh, he hung around the Rat Pack. And his brother-in-law... Peter Lawford was one of the rap pack. He was the brother. Brother-in-law. He was a snivelly fuck, he seemed like. Snivelly? Yeah. Peter Lawford? He kind of seemed like a... He married Kennedy's sister, right? Yeah. Is that the deal? He seemed like a snivelly fuck. Uh, and she now she goes after Olivia again. Your mother never understood crazy passion. If you're married to a powerful man, you better make him feel powerful. And he agrees there. My mother, please. And then she says... New Year's Eve, she was dressed like a refugee. Yeah, he, he doesn't, doesn't like, like that. that. Nor should he. He's looking at his watch. He wants to leave after she says that. He wants to leave. He gives her money, which is an advance. He sniffs a handkerchief. Yeah. You know, which I would never do in a million years. Uh, she's going to get her phone turned on. Tony's getting rent. excited about this, you know. I think she's full of shit. Well, she says, I got to turn on my phone and get my rent paid. And then we see later on, she buys six hundred dollars shoes. Sinatra was there, Peter Lawford, and when he she says Jackie Gleason, he gets excited. He likes that. And we know Terry Winter and uh, Steve Buscemi are big honeymooner fans. And me, Jackie yeah. Gleason fans. Yeah, I guess I would I would imagine Jim was also. Yeah, and Brad Garrett did a great job of playing did Jackie he? Gleason. Great, he won the Emmy Award. Great, and it's funny because Brad six seven or six eight. I don't know how they did it. They made it look, I don't know exactly how they did that, but uh, yeah. he he did a great job. Uh, Valentina's place, Tony Valentina. Well, they had the card sex. game before that. Uh, oh. The hotel. Car, uh, Vito and JT are going head to head there. It's an $800 call. Uh, he's got a full house, Vito. JT. I love down. that Vito's in all the poker games. He's, he plays it good. He's good, yeah. Joe Ganescoli plays it good. He's uh, very real. Vito's in. All yeah. those poker games. He, you know, I remember there was one, somebody said, could you stick around? They kept up playing. He says, where the fuck do I got to go? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is, that's that's what they do to these guys. I he, mean. Someone asked him about the writing. What you're writing on the practice is, is different people write for different characters. They don't <laughs> want to be bothered. JT's annoyed. Uh, and they, they there for days. Days, yeah. Days, you know, I, uh, uh, uh Doyle Brunson's a friend of mine, you know, uh, the great Hall of Fame Doyle poker player. Doyle helped me with uh, Stewie. I met him. Doyle, Stewie. a beautiful guy. His son, Todd, 
I think it was a chef. I did a, a show with him. He was a poker player. Uh, and uh, Doyle told me, I think, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm sure changing it, but uh, five days. He was in a card game for five days. Wow. Straight. Nonstop. Nonstop. But he said five days straight. Wow. Can't smell that good in there. No. Five no, days no, straight. No, 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 no. You know? Uh, then they go to Valentina's. It's a sex scene. Now, apparently, this sex scene was not shot for this episode. It was originally shot for the season opener of season five when they started edit because we would shoot all the episodes before they would go on the air, which is different than most TV shows. Um, it was something about the dog. That's a William Wegman photograph. Yeah. The famous photographer, uh, or paint, it's paint painting, sorry. And she's um, talking in the third person. Show, show Valentini, Valentini a lover. But the dog, the, uh, is it a photo or a uh, painting? I think it's a painting. Painting is a painting. And that really gets him into it. I think he's thinking about Tippy. Tippy, yeah. You know, Wegman has a studio in Chelsea. I've seen him in Chelsea and uh, going in. He has, it's like a garage with an elevator. I saw him pulling into it. I like those dogs. I don't know if it's true. There's a white Miranda. They're the only dogs that could see color. Is that true? Oh, I don't know. But this is making the point. The dog staring at Tony. I think this is why they chose to take it from the season opener, put it in here because the dog plays such a significant part here, the betrayal that uh, Tony. Well, I got a story here. And I believe it's this scene. Jim, when they came back, new season, they come back. Uh, Leslie Baker, and we should have asked her, Leslie had said, I read a book, uh, you know, whatever, Kama Sutra or different positions. She, had, she was bringing some ideas to the scene, right? Because the scene called for missionary position, and she... She wanted well, she, to do you know, something exotic. Well, she wanted to try something different. And Jim told me this. He said, Leslie, I could barely fucking climb on top of you. Let's just do it the way it's written. <laughs> she wanted to get fancy. He well, was. That's, <laughs> she was in character. I don't blame her one bit, but yeah, I don't great. blame him that's for going, funny. hey, you know. Junior's house, Bobby arrives, drops off food. You see, there's a Manhattan special box. Which you love. I love it, too. And they gave us a, that was a little product placement. Of course, they uh, gave us Manhattan special right. on, uh, the on the set all the time. And you say they were out of Citrusel, which is a laxative, right? Uh-huh. Where you going? Got to order some flowers. Sal from the dry cleaners. This kid died, drowned in a jacuzzi, seven years old. Horrible. Dogs can see blue, yellow, and gray. They do not see red, purple, and orange. What about Y. Moranis? Is that the dog in the William Wegman painting? Is it Y. Marana? Yeah. All right, Andy's finding out. So then he's got to tell Melvoin, this kid, his father does my shirts, but it's not a relative. Well, my old man came over with his great-great-grandfather. He had a club foot. <laughs> uh, he, he uh, like I said, very specific, but uh, Melvoin pushes back a little. It's rather tenuous, isn't it? Come on now. We're really reaching here. Right. Uh, even he goes, the whole fucking village of Avellino settled in this area. We got to be related somewhere down the line. Uh, Corrado. Junior goes, Corrado, my pulse. Right. <laughs> Card game. He's JT so good in this episode, too, John oh, Dominic. You know, great. I mean, he's really believable and, and amazing. In JT is still there. Losing. He's down $57,000. Wow. And uh, Vito caught it on the river, which means the last card. So he was, you know, he was. I'm good for it. I'm up for this Dick risk. Wolf thing. If I get on staff, it's like a month's salary. So what, what do they make? Uh, 15000 an episode, a writer on network TV? Scale, you mean? Yeah, what is scale? I don't know. I mean, so I'm that's what sure. he's saying. It's a month's salary. I'm going to assume. Uh, they make more than that. It depends on your deal. Yeah, but... I don't, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, and he says I'll give you 60k. So it's 57. The debt, three grand extra for you to live on. Uh, two points every week. 1,200 bucks on top of the principal. And he's offended, JT. He feels like Chris should just float him the 60 grand. 
And Chris says, I will not enable you. You know, he's bringing JT's up the, a smart ass. He's bringing up the uh, the program stuff. What's the, the most you ever bet on a game, a horse, or a, a hand of blackjack? Two thousand. Two thousand. That's a lot. Oh, a hand of blackjack. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you win. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tony Scar, why Miranda see colors just like other dogs? So I got bad information. You got bad information. Bad information. And all these years, I've been well, – somebody told me that years ago. And who the hell knows what dogs can really see? I mean, come on. <laughs> I don't know. Tony's car. Now, I love this. He's play, He's listening to Rock the Casbah <laughs> by The Clash, which I'm sure relates to the fact that they called Phil the Shah of Iran. Uh -huh. Apparently, Rock the Casbah was the first – rock song they played on the radio in Iran after the Shah was deposed. Oh. It's off the album Combat Rock. I think I think it was totally about Phil, that song. And uh, this is on Grand Avenue in Queens, Phil and Lemon Ice. Tony chases him. Phil crashes. Tony gets out and grabs him. I mean, he really chases him. He's driving like a crazy man. It's a, bit, it's a great stunt. It's yes. a, a very scary crash. The airbag, and they go into a boar's head uh, cold cuts truck, and the airbags go off. That was Flushing Avenue in Brooklyn where that crash happened. But, yeah, it's a, that's a great scene. I love it. He runs in there and grabs him by the neck, and he's in pain. And he's Tony makes it like he's trying to help him. He pulls his, his neck. He's fucking pulling his hair. Where's my fucking money? You got 24 hours. I'll get it. I'll get it. Tony is pissed off. Really pissed off. Yeah. Uh, the Phil, the little thing you notice, he got some lemon ice, uh, some Italian ice. He threw it out he the window. He holds on to it as long as he can. Then, and then he, he tosses he's it. Go. Little boys wake. The mother cries. You like lemon ice? Oh, sure. Did you ever go to the uh, Lemon Ice King of Corona? No. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I never went there. Lemon Ice King in Corona, Queens. There's They have like, I don't know how many freaking, 50 flavors. Or I used like to just it's go. It's the most delicious yeah. I, Italian ice you ever have. And they I, have crazy, great flavors, tons of flavors. I you got to go there. Just go regular bakeries, you know. No, they, they always all have had good, chocolate, vanilla, you, with, uh, I mean, chocolate, lemon. Uh, you know what I used to like? Uh, the uh, pretzel rods. I like dipping the pretzel rod in the I've never had lemon that. ice. I've never had that. Thank you for Go to the Lemon Ice King of Corona. All right. You got to go. go. It's right next to a little park where they play bocce over there. We Corona. should go. It's really good. Do you like licorice? Is that they near the park side? It's not near the park side restaurant. I don't know. They have licorice flavored ice, like the black. I don't like licorice. licorice. Well, don't get that one. Uh, little boys wake. Junior enjoys food. Well, we should go, Junior. Relax. We just got here. Just Chicken's got nice and spicy, <laughs> huh? Junior's, Women, Junior's, the woman is crying. The mother, I mean. It's terrible. He's just. It's uh, very funny, yeah. and it's terrible. And uh, Junior's out of control here. JT's plays. JT plays a game on a computer. Junior pounds He's on the. He's playing snood. <laughs> that game. Christopher pounds on the door. What are you ducking me? You want the truth? I was away. Lie after lie after lie. On the fridge, it says first things first, which is a AA slogan, uh, which is a good, nice little detail there. Yeah, he's lying. The money about, uh, you know, he went to AC, but you don't have money to play Chris. Uh, to pay Chris, he talks about Rene Balsay, who was a showrunner on Law and Order, also created Law and Order Criminal Intent. Uh, I got I got out of that business, Chris says, because people fuck you over. John Favreau stole my ideas. I swear on all that's holy, I'll have your money back next week. That wasn't the deal. I'll be back tomorrow. Don't make me a jerk off. Uh, he told his agent, Dick, Dick Wolf's guy, his agent likes his stuff. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. All bullshit. Uh, Vesuvio. They're like on a date here. Yeah. Tony eats her friend. She shows off her new heels. There's the Tony should know Six, just by seeing $600 this. $600 shoes. Thought you were paying your phone bill. Yeah. It's been so long since I've been able to, to treat myself. Turns out Uncle Zio's going down. Oh, poor guy's taking it very hard. Gold digging. Gold digging, gold digging big time. The, the music playing there, John Coltrane's uh, version of My Favorite Things, which was from the... Sound of music. She could care less about his uncle going downhill. She, she wants a drink. Less. 
She bought the shoes. That's what she gives a fuck about. JT's place. Once again, little Pauly. Solid, solid, like Benny. Gets the job done. Work, yeah. He's uh, all about the work. Business. Comes in. Christopher, little Paulie arrived. You got it. I told you I need more time. He's arrogant. I don't have the money. What are you going to do about it? Then fucking get it. Uh, Chris, you know what? What could you possibly do about it? Haven't already been done. What? He thinks he's, I don't know who he thinks he's fucking with. I, I guess he, he is a Hollywood guy. He doesn't know who he's fucking he with. He doesn't realize that, uh, you know, this is the real this deal. This is the real deal. This is no TV show. He says, what is this, Pulp Fiction? I'm supposed to be afraid. He's wearing a t-shirt that says California as seen on TV, which is another great They thing. give him a beaten, uh... Uh, it, it makes me laugh when you when Christopher punches him in the face. It makes me laugh every time I see it's it. I don't funny. know why. He's so arrogant. Uh, yeah. He's smarter and better than them. You know, little Paulie. Little Paulie does the job, does just the like job. Benny gets it done. Funeral home. They Uncle. hit him over the head with a Doctor Strange love poster. Have you seen that movie? <laughs> Stanley Kubrick. Uh, Peter Sellers plays I, I saw it three ago. different. Parts in that movie, and it's, it's he's good. amazing. I George just, C. Scott, Sterling Hayden, it's a really good movie. What did I just see? I just saw with uh, Peter Sellers, uh, where he's the gardener. Well, being there, that's a great one. One yeah. of my favorite movies. Yeah, I Written just saw by, it for the first time. That was based on uh, Jerzy Kaczynski's novel. Being it was great. great. Yeah, and he's he's so good in that movie. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Uncle Zio's funeral. Father Phil gives the eulogy. Junior starts hysterically crying. They were just together for down. seventy years. A lot of and he talks about you know the the wife just died and he now he just a lot that happens very often. Yeah. You know. What's it? Days later, Junior Bobby runs over. What's the matter? What's the point? I can't take it anymore. Funeral after funeral. This fucking uh, shit. It What's got to him. Point? He's great in the scene, man. I mean, Junior Dominic. loses it. Everyone's there. Everyone's at the funeral. Just completely loses Edie, it. Edie, who doesn't say anything in the scene, is really great. Just her reaction to Junior, which she's she's reacting by not reacting, but there's something very specific she does. Just great detail. But Dominic's. Well, I don't fantastic. think Edie even. We see Edie twice. I don't think she speaks for this episode. No. Great, uh, Dominic. You know when when fantastic. you have heavy episodes. And she was heavy in the one before this. Right. Very heavy. Right. Uh, when you know, it's like, uh, you know, you're still getting paid, you know, right. but you kind of cruise. Kinda you're nice. with everybody. It's kind of nice, right? You, you, can you relax. work hard for a couple. Now yeah. you, you have few lines or right. not much. You don't have to work hard. You're getting paid. You got these scenes where. It's yeah. like you're like a pitcher, right? You pitched the last game. Now you can sit yeah, on the take bench it a easy a little, and uh, everyone's there, so you're all together. No pressure on you. You don't have to cry like Dominic. You don't have to do anything. That's pretty. Uh, I like that. Yeah. Pawn shop. JT tries to sell his Emmy. JT, it's a fucking Emmy. It's gold plated. They melt it down, man. Fifteen bucks. He wants to give him. For if, if it's an Oscar, maybe I can give you a little something. Academy Award, TV, <laughs> another. Joke about TV, mocking it. What else you got? I got a laptop. I'll check that out. Uh, crazy Horse Office. Little Paulie brings Chris the money from your friend. Here's a 1200 So that's just the that's interest. That's the interest. So it's know. 1200 a week. And now he 1200 and he's not taking the debt down. No, he's still 1200 You could pay that 1200 for 10 years. Right. And guys do. Right. That's all they could make. They could. They can't make it. A lot of times, people will go to Shylock's, right, and they'll borrow the money, and they figure, you know, well, I'm selling the house, or I'm going to inherit this, or the business deal will go through, and it never it goes through. through. And they pay these exorbitant twelve hundred dollars, thousand dollars a week for years, without touching the principal. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, they say he was nodding out. He's on dope. Chris is Chris is acting like son of a fucking baby. Like he's disappointed. The guy's like going back to dope. Well, that's what's ironic here. I yeah. mean, Chris has uh, beat him up, wants the money, adding all this pressure, but is worried him about him. to the card game where he lost all the but, money. But, the, but it's worried about him staying sober. How could he possibly stay sober? And there's a little sign uh, on the in the in the crazy office. Expect miracles, which is another kind of. AA thing, which I think is a, Our friend makes dinner for Tony. 
This is the money from the closing, the racetrack, 150 grand. I can't believe that he's given this. And she time. says, that's great. She says, not a lot of gratitude. She's just kind of like. I can't believe that he's not like saying, here's 10 or here's 20, you know, give it to you in a few yeah. weeks. I mean, she could blow a gamble. She could die herself. She also doesn't. She's kind of like, that's great. I'm she's stunned. Non plus. I'm about stunned it. where, you know, he's giving it all to her. Cash. Crazy. She's making Manhattans, and she 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 makes these uh, water chestnuts with ba very like cocktail, very like old school Playboy magazine. Cocktail yeah, nineteen fifties, sixties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. bacon with the water chestnuts. Uh, your dad and I drove down the shore to Hesh's. Hesh had he, uh, rented a place at Point Pleasant. It was right before Labor Day. Actually, it was a couple of months before he died. We stopped at the liquor store. He had to pee. I needed some cigarettes. And boom, the light bulb goes off here. Wait a second. My dad had emphysema and you kept smoking. Even my mother quit. He didn't mind. Tony says he could barely breathe. And it's a big moment because he realizes, wait a second. You know, because he's romanticized this relationship and her and who she was and demonized his mother for whatever reason, for a lot of reasons. And I now he's saying this woman was smoking while my dad had emphysema and was dying of it. I think she was just a hustler, even to the father. I don't she think totally she was. Well, I don't think also, she. I don't think she meant that much to his father either. No, and you see it in the flashback, which we'll get to yeah. in a minute. Tony shows Fran the JFK hat. I brought it. She puts it on, sings "Happy Birthday." It feels to me like she's seducing him here. She is. And, and it's kind of pathetic. I heard that that was Henry Bronckteen, uh, Bronckteen's idea for her, for her to put the hat on and sing the song. Really? That's what I read. Oh. Uh, that song was sung by Marilyn Monroe at JFK's 45th birthday party, which was a Democratic Party fundraiser, May 19th, 1962, at Madison Square Garden. Marilyn would wind up dead three months later. I think Tony realizes she's uh, no good. Finally, uh, he doesn't like she smoked. Uh, I think, yeah, I think this pushes him over the edge. It, it, it's, pathetic. Yeah. It, it's pathetic. It's uh, pathetic. He doesn't like what he sees, Tony, and it's kind of pathetic with the hat on. I, maybe my toes curl. I cringed a little. Yeah, I think that's the point. She really puts it over, and she and and she's uh, Polly Bergen's great in this scene. Um, I think he is totally over her at that point, and. For a few reasons, and that just uh, pushes him over the edge there. Crazy. You know, and he this is he just gave her one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Crazy! I'm very surprised that he gave the money. JT's place, Chris and JT talk. I met with the Dick Wolf guy. They hired some kid from Yale. The apartment's when, empty. You see, he's sold everything in the apartment. Plus, now the money I owe you, my ex fucking wife. How many times have you shot up? Five or six. I thought I had it under control. Every junkie says I thought I had it under control. And then he says, you should have called me. We're in the program. You call you, you know, which is. I mean, in every movie, you know, the, the guy does heroin. I thought I had it under control. No, you don't have it under control. You're not going to have it under control. Sure. Melfi's office, Tony, you know, I don't uh, fucking live with my mistress. I mean, his fucking slippers, when I left there, I started thinking about it when I was 16 years old, my son's age. Tony's not liking. She knocked his mother. Only he could knock his mother. Right. She doesn't like, he doesn't like this whole scenario. No, and now it's really, yeah, he's, he's turned on this whole thing. You know? Flashback, Soprano House. Tony, I came home from school and there was a snow for my Aunt Quinn. My mother had been pregnant with another kid after my sister Barbara changed her life. Baby, they called it. Started bleeding. Uh, I finally, that night, uh, I was supposed to find my father. Don't forget, before cell phones, how do you find them? He's calling all over the neighborhood, probably. Gets him. He's with Fran. He's with Johnny Fran, Boy. And she's like, the lamb chops are going to be over. They're canoodling in bed. The lamb chops are going to, you know, get off the phone, she's telling him, basically. Uh, I'm tied up. And he doesn't go. This is terrible. That shows you what kind of guy he was. Yeah. His wife's in the hospital, possibly dying. And Tony lies to Livia, his mother, when she, know, she knows he was with Fran. She knows that. And he says, I was at the Yankee game. The car broke down. We had to stay at Cousin Jimmy's. Tony was with me. Anthony, you know, was with me. And he lies and says All yes. All bullshit. 
one lie after the other broke down. We stayed kind of, what the fuck? And then uh, I think young Tony was watching either Conrad uh, or Jake Cannon. and Cannon, Cannon or Jake and the Fat Man. No, that was Cannon. Cannon. Jake and the Fat Man was much later. Cannon, that was William Conrad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the 70s. Yeah. They didn't hire the fat people back then. Everyone was good looking. Not everyone. Most people. Those shows. Most leading men. The leading men or, were so. good looking, That's good true. looking guys, manics. Did you watch this Cannon? one? I, I did watch I Cannon. Watched it. Oh. All these shows had all these, you know, Robert Wagner right. and, and uh, you know, good looking Garner. guys. Very few fat guys. Skipper from Gilligan's Island. Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason, but not many, not many fat guys. Especially dramatic, in. you know, comedians. Is these different. were. Good looking, you know, so leading were, men. The were, women were broke. all good looking. Charlie's Angels. Everybody's better looking than the next. Yeah. You know? They broke the glass ceiling, those guys. They were pioneers. For 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 guys like me. Yeah. I I owe William Conrad so much. You do. For being a pioneering fat man that <laughs> led the way for me. And Alan Hale Jr., the skipper. Right? If they never made it to TV, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. Thank God for them. He was kind of like Jackie Robinson. William he was, like, yes. he was the Jackie Robinson of Fat Man. There you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, even when uh, young Tony tells Livia she doesn't believe him. She turns her head. She doesn't believe she him. She can't say anything about and it. And Tony's resenting Fran there, but then he turns on Livia again. Fuck her. He doesn't blame his father. You know, the dog, Livia would have had the dog killed. I mean, he's, you know, I don't know. She could have fucking died. Uh, she could have fucking died, you know, from a miscarriage. Uh, this is uh, very important. Your mother had a fault. So you need to forgive her and move on. She made my father give my dog away. It was up to her. She would have had it killed. Yeah. Fuck her. You know, what do you want to do? Burn her at the stake? Right. I thought your father was a big tough guy. Why did he listen to her? Good point. Good point. Yeah. The IHOP parking lot. JT signs over his uh, car. Book value seventeen so, grand. It's a BMW, I think. Knock yeah. it off the principal. Uh, it's a funny and a sad scene. JT's going to rehab. They'll figure out the rest of the payments. Christopher says, you can do this. I have faith in you. Remember, there's no chemi chemical solution to a spiritual problem. <laughs> Dr. Weiner's office, Tony Jr. and Janice meet with Dr. Weiner. Uh, it could have been another stroke. It's hard to tell. The medicine stopped working. I took a... Uh, I took more and it didn't do shit, Junior says. It's, I'm like the walking dead. I'm so fucking blue. He's very depressed. Very depressed. Uh, I said, well, what do you want? All you do is go to funerals. And he says, I'm living in a grave. I beat prison for what? No children? My oh. life is only death. Would someone please explain this to me? Yeah. Bada bing. Tony Silvio, Tony B and Artie drink at the table. So uh, Hedge tells me you met your dad's gumata and Tony paints a rosy picture. She was JFK's girlfriend for three years. He had it to the White House for the weekends when his wife was out of town. This woman was like a princess, I'll tell you what. For all that, Jackie Kennedy thought the marriage was over. It's all bullshit. He's trying and to then say you see, It's a great shot there at the end, right? So you, talk, you got Tony, then there's this sh kind of a POV shot of the strippers. You know, he's almost like romanticizing his the Gumar as this, you know, babe. And then a shot of him smoking a cigar and drinking. He's kind of, he's kind of walking in the same footsteps as his father in a way. And the song comes on, Melancholy Serenade, which was the theme song so, to, the honeymoon to the Jackie Gleason show, written by Jackie Gleason, who also wrote the theme to the Honeymooners, which is called... The Honeymooners theme song is called You're My Greatest Love. Both of those songs written by Jackie Gleason. Apparently, he he wrote 43 albums of mood music. Who Talented knows? guy. Very underrated. Talented guy. Great. Still, still kind of underrated, though. They know him for Never the won an Emmy. Yeah. Never won an like Emmy. Like me. Like me. Like you. Exactly like <laughs> you. <laughs>
Jackie Gleason never won an Emmy. Can you imagine that? Uh, great episode, Camelot. Great uh, episode. I love it. It's one of my favorites. Season though. five. And as the clock ticks, now it's time for the Talking Sopranos Ask Me Anything segment. The winner of our AMA best question is Will from Norman, Oklahoma. Was sending Will a pair of Bose headphones. Will asks, who is more diabolical, Janice Olivia? Who is it? It's a good question. In my opinion, Livia. Oh! Livia wanted to have her own son killed. But Janice is a murderer. Yeah, but to, to want to kill your own son. But Janice murdered someone. Yeah, but for Her fiancé that supposedly she loved. Who? D but he kind of deserved it. Did Tony Soprano deserve it? People deserve killing now? He was a bad That's dude, not... man. You kidding me? What he did to Beansy, he beat her. No, no, he was a bad guy. I just don't know. I mean, she's a murderer. She did it. I Livia think she's may have more, wanted. I think maybe she's more dangerous. But diabolical, that word. Andy, can you look up the dictionary what exactly diabolical means? She's... she's Diablo. Does it come from the devil? Does listen, Diablo? she is... Janice uh, is a big manipulator. She stole the woman's leg. She's a thief. Oh, no, she's... She's a horrible yeah. person. But Livia was evil, too. Scared these kids. Livia was, but... More manipulative. But not at the end. There. But she didn't murder anyone. Characteristic of the devil. Or so evil as to be suggestive of the devil. Well. I say a, Livia. It's a good question. And I'm saying Janice. And it's a great question. It's a really good question. Uh, you know, well, here's the, the, the biggest takeaway of this whole thing is. Like mother, like daughter, I don't and know. like son. There you go, the murderer, and flat like out son. murderer, and the father, and the father. murderer, yeah, flat out murderer. There you go. I'm saying, uh, Will from Norman, wherever Norman, Oklahoma is, I'm sure you'll be the first uh, person in town with a Bose headphones. Oh, so I will. <laughs> oh, come on. It was a joke. I can't joke. What you got all you 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 got all irate over the gobble ghoul thing? Now you're me messing with people from Norman. Oh, well, you know okay. you don't like them talking about gobble ghoul and mozzarella. I apologize. I'm don't apologize. To, don't look at me. I don't live there. Okay, and I'm being dead serious. People of Norman, Oklahoma, I apologize. It was a little joke. You know me if you listen to this podcast. I talk shit sometimes. <laughs> I mean you no harm. <laughs> Uh, no, he means no harm. He's just my apologies for Will and from everyone in Norman, Oklahoma. I love you, and I hope to visit someday. And there you go. Thanks for listening. And remember, new episodes are released every Monday. Please subscribe to the Talking Sopranos podcast, YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. Right now, you can get official Talking Soprano merchandise, tank tops, T-shirts, hats, Steve Sharipa motherfucks the world, mugs hosted by Michael Imperioli, uh, TalkingSopranos.com or through our YouTube channel. Our executive producer is Jeff Sussman. Our producer is Andy Verderam. Our music was composed and performed by Elijah Amiton. You can hear more of Elijah's music and the band Zopa, which Elijah and I play in together by clicking the links at TalkingSopranos.com. Our production crew includes Ty Verderam and Sierra Sharipa. We record Talking Sopranos at NYC Podcasting. Great studio, great prices, great people. It is the premier podcast studio in New York City, located on the lovely Lower East Side. Go to nycpodcasting.com, whether you're a brand new podcast or looking to upgrade your show. They can take care of everything. All your podcasting needs will be met at nycpodcasting.com. All right. Talking Great Sopranos episode. is a Pod Gems production. Great episode, really man. Good one. Talk to you. I love that one. I'll see you. See you later.